Welcome everybody, boils and ghouls, to the dark forest. Tonight's video, I got some friends alongside me around this campfire tonight, telling some spooky zombie apocalypse scary stories. If you like their narrations, check out their channels. Their information will be in the description box down below. Now... Let's get spooky. An explosion rattles the helicopter we're in. I look down at the demolished helicopter and see a bright orange haze blocking my view. As it dissipates, I could see the downed copter is now nothing but a disfigured mess of ash and metal. Another growl shakes me from my trance as I take another look to my right and see that the thing is nearly on top of me. Without another thought, I grab the shoulders of its bulletproof vest and begin to push it to the edge of the copter. The people around me quickly realize the situation and begin screaming and kicking at the biter sitting next to me, creating a loud commotion in the plane and blocking any shots from being fired. The biter turns its attention to the other people on board, and I know I only have seconds before we end up like the helicopter beneath us. Despite the heavy armor hanging on the thing's limbs, after gathering all the remaining energy I had left in my muscles, I shoved the thing as far out with my arms as I could. I lost my grasp on the biter as I felt my hands give out and sharply turned downwards. The thing's fading screech was the only thing that made me realize that throughout the whole ordeal, I hadn't taken a single breath. I took in a huge portion of air before crawling back deeper into the plane. The crowd inside is huddled in the middle, no one wanting to accidentally slip and fall onto their deaths. Part military personnel on board is hastily putting restraints on the outer edge part of the plane to keep a locked and safe perimeter. A few people wearing a thick, all-camo outfit manage to slowly but surely make their way towards me without causing too much inconvenience. Sir, are you alright? We saw you single-handedly take down that biter. We're sorry we couldn't support you, but with all these civilians, one of them... Presumably, the sergeant speaks up. It's alright. No more lives were lost. That's what matters. I say, peeking through the constraints being installed on my side of the copter. We're going to have to check you, though. He responds. Can't have any more of these things on board. As his men begin to closely inspect me, he continues. Are you feeling well? No signs of lightheadedness, tight chest, difficulty breathing, etc. As the short answers to his questions nearly end, the soldiers around me warp up with their observations. Their commander tells me that you could call it a miracle that no other people were close enough to me to have spread the infection. You handled that situation fairly well. Judging by your uniform, you're a cop, aren't you? How many years have you been in service? He curiously asked. Uh, about six years now. Been a hell of a ride. Uh, used to be. The copter violently shakes before I could finish. We all struggle to find something to hang on to against the turbulence. The helicopter eventually calms, and we regain our balance. Not as much of a hell as this, huh? The commander says, still clutching the metal bar he had found at the side of the copter. He shakes his head and looks at me. When we heard the distress signal coming from your area, they sent out the first aircrafts they could get their hands on. He stops and goes silent for a moment. Didn't expect so many of you to be here. I mean... More helicopters were on the way, so it wouldn't have been so crowded, but... How couldn't it have happened so damn fast? He ponders, 
lost in thought. I take the time to take a better look through the gaps in the outside entrance of the copter. After struggling to get back up, my legs eventually regained balance on the metal floor. I peered out onto the ground and saw that the emergency broadcasts were doing their job with keeping people inside. Nearly all the houses that had lights on with their cars in the parking lot with no one visible on the ground. Suddenly, I get the urge to ask the first thing that's supposedly to pop up in my head. Sir, do you mind telling me where exactly our destination lies? The military commander turns his face to me and automatically speaks. Nowhere special. If you're interested, away from those biters at least. Before he trails off again, I repeat my question in a more aggressive tone. Where are we going, sir? His response sends me off guard as he looks me straight in the eye and sternly says, You'll know when we land. Sit tight. That instantly shuts me up, and the rest of the trip is nearly quiet aside from your daily coughs and sneezes similar to the ones in public transports. The commander made occasional announcements, telling us not to panic and that we're going to be brought somewhere safe. He also instructed everyone to hand over all their gadgets and any kind of weapons they were carrying. After a thorough search through our bags and pockets, he also addressed everyone in the police force, including me, to not contact our superiors or any other colleagues via radio. Even though I didn't receive any news about the progression of the outbreak, the radios the military held were still on. Unfortunately, that didn't help my case as a few times the military personnel on board did use them. Their codes were so scrambled trying to decipher it, it would have led to an irritating headache within minutes. However, after a while of this, I felt my ears begin to pop and noticed that we were slowly dropping altitude. I still didn't know where we were supposed to arrive, but I was starting to notice fewer shelters on the ground and overall more rural landscapes the further we flew from the city. I was considering again asking the question now that we were close when the commander made another announcement. Alright, listen up. We're preparing to land at our destination. You'll have multiple guards escorting you into the building, so don't even think about trying anything. And don't struggle. It'll make the whole ordeal so much simpler. He pauses. And safer. The next thing I know, the helicopter slowly begins to drop downwards and I see a group of guards standing outside. When the copter touches the ground beneath us and its propellers slowly came to a stop, a number of soldiers emerged from the group of armed men and split us up into three small groups. I ended up in the second group and watched as the first group was taken away by the first batch of soldiers awaiting outside. As they walked away, I saw another helicopter had landed in another land pad not far away from us. People from inside the plane began to walk out, and I saw a familiar teen walk out and start a fuss. I thought the other soldiers and his buddies were trying to warn him, but I didn't get the time to see, because just as he pushed a commanding officer, with a leap of strength a soldier came up to him and smashed the butt of his rifle against the teen's face with brute force. The teen dropped and I saw two men pick him up and carry away his limp body. As the scene faded, I heard a gruff voice telling us to get out of the plane. We did what he said and once we were out, the soldiers patted our sides and pockets and we began walking to the direction of the building in front of us. It had no extraordinary remarks aside from the grayish haze that coated the surface of its three-story floors. I tilted my head around just enough to inspect my surroundings and not cause any suspicion. I glanced at the guards and saw that their faces were calm but still had their hands tightly gripped on their M4s at their sides. I also managed to sneak a look over my shoulder and guessed that we were in the middle of nowhere since there was nothing in sight aside from a few distant trees. I didn't notice how my pace slowed down as I continued to hastily look around. Hey! 
Move it, officer! This ain't a museum, a soldier behind me says as he forcefully nudges me forward. I annoyingly pulled my hand away and continued to move forward. When we reach the building, I see another task force is already waiting for us just outside the entrance. The previous soldiers that were with us leave and go back towards the helicopter while the new troops take us in. Inside, the first thing that shows up is a hallway with offices on either side all leading up towards a set of stairs. We are tentatively escorted up the stairs leading to the second floor, where a lounge of some sort stood before we even have time to get off the stairs. We again find ourselves being pushed up and continued walking until we reach the next floor, where I see six cages strategically positioned on the walls, three on each side, and one already occupied with the first group that got out of the helicopter. This was the final straw for all of us. Everyone in my group began to barricade the soldiers with bitter comments relating to the fact that there was no way any of us were going in there. I watched the first group, expecting them to rise up with us, but all they did was pitifully stare at us. Soon enough, the soldiers' warnings to temper our anger proved to be pointless, and that's when they began aiming their guns at us and nearly screaming at us to get inside the cage. This quieted the collective anger we held, as one of the officers placed a keycard on the lock, and one by one we stepped inside the cage. When we were all inside, the soldiers shut the door and went to check on the other group. What I hadn't really realized is that aside from me, there were only two other people with me in my group, though it always seemed like we had more. After a few minutes of thought and silence, one of the people with us walked up to me and offered a hand. Name's Rob. Brad, pleasure, I say as he observes me in my uniform. Ah, so you were on the front lines. Must be really nice with all that action. Ha, <laughs> oh, you bet, I sarcastically remarked. Just then, we hear shouts come from the staircase and I see a rowdy group, just a bit bigger than ours, come and arguing with the soldiers. Get your hands off me! I can walk alone! I hear someone yelling in the group. We already told you we're not getting inside those damn cages, so why don't you take that shiny rifle of yours and shove it up your... That's when one of the soldiers had had enough and points his rifle threateningly close to the guy making insults. Just like us, their protests stop rather quickly and they get inside the cage beside us one by one. As they were entering the cage, I took a close look at all of them and when the last person from their group stepped inside the cage, I instantly recognized who he was. Tyler! Oh my god! I thought you were dead! Where were you back there? Tyler turns around to face me, and I could see the shock and relief come past his face. Brad! Good to see you're still standing! I thought I saw you at one point back there by the outcast, but... There was just so many damn people, and those biters everywhere! He looked upwards as if he was trying to recall something. I can't remember a thing. Last thing I know, I was getting shoved into a helicopter... Then I wake up and we're soaring through the air. Then those soldiers. Assholes. Suddenly, a thought came to the front of my mind. Hey, were you on the helicopter where those guards knocked out that kid from earlier? What kid? Oh yeah, I was with him on the copter. Frankly, he was annoying the hell out of everyone during the trip. Warning after warning. Thought they would carry him away or something. But they couldn't handle it. Hope he's okay now, though, Tyler answers. We stand behind the barbed walls in front of us as we both think back at what had happened. You know, Tyler begins, how does one start in a battlefield defending their nation only for them to be repaid by being shoved into a small confined cage with nothing but rusty sink and a toilet? I mean, 
We could be treated like veterans, not some kind of prisoners. Would have at least given us a nice small room with some essentials, he laughs. Guess they really want to keep us on edge, I chuckle. And chances are, nobody even knows. Wait, what do you mean that nobody even knows? You have some people you know here, right? They'll notice you're missing, and not the truth is out there. I don't know. I don't get called in when these things start. Local military don't hear of it for a while. They didn't tell us when this whole thing started. Didn't tell us when it got here. Hell, they still probably are not telling anyone what happened back there. Probably already contacting our families and friends, I disclose. But they couldn't just hide all that, could they? We stand there silently, once again getting lost in thought when Rob approaches. Wait, you didn't know any of this? He says in a surprised tone. Well, I didn't know about my colleagues since I was on vacation, but in terms of protocol, they should have contacted me earlier. Chances are everyone's orders are delayed until the last second. Wow, they really want to keep this a secret from everyone, huh? Didn't they realize all this would just lead to this? Why didn't they send you all out? Because they thought they could stop it. An aged voice came from behind us. We turned to a crouched man, probably in his mid-sixties, standing in a crouched position on the other side of the cage. His white hair was brushed to the side. His chin was shaven, but he wore a pale face with tired eyes. They did it once. Thought they could get away with it again, he said, almost like he was recollecting a past moment in his life. What do you mean they could do it again? This is the first time the police and military force have encouraged this kind of outbreak at this scale. If they hadn't, we wouldn't be standing here in this godforsaken cage, I exclaimed. That was the idea. Dealt with it once. Comes up again, no sweat. But that's not what happened. We stared at him with curiosity, waiting for him to continue. There was... A similar case once when I was still fit to serve. I was on a patrol when they called us in. The voice sounded urgent, desperate even. By the time we had arrived, most of the action had already wrapped up and I still heard the last gunshots and the last screams, even with the windows closed. I had noticed aside from us, but there was also agents probably the FBI already scanning the area. They hurriedly led us away, but I managed to catch just a glimpse of what was never meant to be seen. Someone shot out of there. It looked like an officer, but something was off. He was about to jump on someone. Then I heard a shot ring out. I didn't want to see the rest of it. In any case, I played dumb afterwards during the interviews, but... My God, how many years have passed. His fingertips rubbed the surface of his closed eyelids in an exhausting manner. They know how to keep you silent. They'll learn everything about you, keep you in line with such intimidation. Well, it's only when you're old like me when your days are numbered that you don't care how many threats they throw at you. He signs and looks at me. I'm sorry what you had to see today, son. If they release us, I want you to get to as many other people as you can and get as far away from this place as possible. It's only a matter of time. I nod at him with empathy in my eyes before he looks away and I ask, Hey, I didn't catch your name. He turns his attention back on me. Oh, I almost forgot. Chris. My name's Chris, he says, just as we begin to hear the familiar voices of struggling coming from the stairs down below us. I don't remember how much time passed as we all sat in those cages. Sometimes, people would be brought by and shoved into nearby cages or sent to another sector altogether. Aside from surveilling us 24-7, 
they had daily checks on us concerning any symptoms or temperatures we had. Some people tried to defy their authority by not answering their questions, but by the third day, there wasn't any hesitation to comply with what they had said. There wasn't any visible clocks. The only thing keeping me on track was the time of the meals they brought us. Each day, and nightly lights out, they would announce as they walked by each cell. Each time was no different. We were in the middle of a discussion when the main lights turned off and the backup ones came on. We heard footsteps walk past our cells doing the usual drill. We all said our goodnights and I lumbered off into a crimson darkness. Good morning, sleepy asses. Don't care how you slept. Need all your ears and eyes now. I was suddenly awoken by the commander's voice, people drowsily rubbing their eyes and looking at him. Everyone, get to the back of your confinement. The following called up will step up to the front of their cell and wait until given further instructions. We have all your personal data and know what you look like, so anyone that decides to commit identity fraud will be severely punished. We all move to the back of the cages as he begins reading the names of his list. Why do you think they're calling people up? Rob whispered to me. Probably questioning from what I guess. The commander finishes reading the list and ends with a final name. Brad Harrison. After the initial shock of hearing my name, I walk to the front of the cage and turn around. Rob is peering at me with worried eyes, while Chris is looking at me with confidence, almost determination. Do not attempt to struggle while we extract you from your cell, the officer says as nearby units begin unlocking our cages. The cage to my cell opens up and I begin to step out. Before they have me in handcuffs position, I manage to catch a glimpse at Tyler who gives me the approving nod as he lines up to the front and begins to walk forward. We're all pulled out of our cells and watch as the rest of the soldiers move to the other sectors while we began to head towards the stairs. Even though this would have made a great opportunity to make a run for it, something kept all of us intact, almost like the feeling that we should just follow the guard's orders. We head down to the next floor and enter the room with the lounge I had previously seen the first time I was on these stairs. We walk past most of the room, when I see a single door on the left at the end of the room. Beside the door, two soldiers were standing with rifles in hand. One of them pulled out a key card and used it to open the door we were heading for. Once we're all inside the well-lit room, we see a few groups are already sitting down on separate aluminum benches you would see in stadiums. We start moving towards an empty bench when I notice something. On all the benches, there are regular people in civilian clothing aside from one member in each of the group. Unlike the civilians around them, they wore a uniform, but not one of a guard, but more one of similar of a commanding officer. I didn't have time to ponder on the thought as we are all ushered onto the bench. And just like in the other groups, a man older than me but younger than Chris is already waiting for us. We all sit down, as a high-ranking officer comes to the middle of the room and waits for the few nearly inaudible whispers to stop before he clears his throat. Now, I can guess what you're probably thinking right now. The commander starts with a friendly but firm voice. And after all you've been through, I can't say I blame you. However, we need to be aware of those infected and those not, because if one more mistake was made, it would be over for all of us. Know that your family and friends have been contacted and you just might have a chance to see them again. The outbreak that you previously witnessed has been suppressed, and the majority of the biters have been taken out by the military. That said, our local military forces have exhausted all their weaponry and manpower into extraditing the biters. And aside from keeping the city on lockdown, they barely have enough men to patrol half of the quarantine off zone. Meaning for now, they're temporarily defective in the fight. 
The quarantine area is large in perimeter, and any open space can prove vital for the biters if they find a way out, and fatal to us. Military outside of our own has only recently received news of the outbreak, and by the time they arrive, well, every second counts in any case. Their inexperience will cost them many lives if they do arrive on time. But you, my friends, you have the experience. The one essential in wiping out those things from the face of the earth. But there is also another reason why we put such high faith in you. We gathered you all here because you were all trained men in defending the nation. You know what these things are, and you know how to deal with them. Without you, these biters could escape and all the armies we have... Without you, these biters could have escaped and all the armies we have wouldn't be enough to stop them. So I give you an offer. You can either go back now and return back to your cell, get released, and hope you can live a normal life soon. Or you can do the entire world a favor and end this nightmare for good. Everyone in the room is silent, deciding what to do next. No one leaves. Good choice, the commander asserts, catching everyone's eye in the room. Now, before you go, I'd like all of you to meet someone. This is Professor Lestings. He conveys, pointing to a middle-aged man with white hair and bags under his eyes emerging from the seats far back. He'll explain the procedures needed to be executed if someone within your group gets bitten, and if you haven't already heard them, the protocols. The commander sits down on one of the free spaces on the benches as the professor gets on stage. Thank you for your introduction, Captain. As you have heard, I am Professor Lestings, the head medical personnel in this facility. From what you have seen, I have no doubt that you know how to eliminate a flesh biter, but there are some things you are missing that could be crucial in saving your own life in an encounter with one of these biters. You see, when someone gets bitten, the substance emitted from the biters takes control over their brain, making their victim unable to the virus's actions. The exact origin of this virus is not precisely known, as well as the exact location of its outbreak. The virus's effects are fairly rapid and the scale of infection has been unexpected to say the least. One of the main factors concerning the prolification of these biters is the hesitation. The creation of an antidote is still in process for the initial stages of the infection. Where the redemption is still possible, however, a cure has yet to be created. So in the case of infection, it will take the virus a maximum of two or three minutes to take a hold of the host before they have to be terminated to stop the virus from operating in their system. The professor looks at all of us and changes his tone. This is the last point where you can turn back. As when you enter the quarantined area, no one will let you in or out until all the biters are eliminated and before the threat becomes irreversible. The doc repeats the other protocols, and after he finishes... We're all combined into groups of 12 to form task forces, ensuring the last of the biters are taken out. We're taken through the main procedures of the plan, and after we're all ready, we hastily gather all the equipment and get to the copters. During the short flight, I wonder what will happen when I get there. Still being nagged by the unnerving memory of seeing the blue veins spread across the insides of the biter's face. My commander seems to notice and questions me about it. You all right, champ? You look a little stale. I'm fine, commander. Just reviewing the plan, that's all. I say with a wee smile. I know what you saw out there. Those things ain't pretty. They take away whatever they can get their hands on from you. But life ain't easy. And you just have to get through it with these things sometimes. And if we don't do this now, then we will never get a chance to do it again. He looks me in the eye. Yeah, you're right, Commander. You're right. 
he begins leaning back on his chair when I ask him, Have you ever seen anything like this? He turns around, surprised, and slowly answers my question. No, I, uh, haven't. Why do you ask? It's nothing. Whether this had happened before or not, those biters are going back to where they belong, oblivion. The commander's concerned look turns into a smile. There's hope for you yet, kid. I noticed the helicopters were beginning to lower as we all braced ourselves for the last impact. Once the copters touched the ground, we all got a hold of our rifles and jumped out onto the grass. As we all began jogging towards the barbed fence, I took in the familiar surroundings I had seen the last time I was here. Caution tape was still loosely hanging around the park as the usual sounds of birds chirping along the tone. As we got closer to the entrance of the quarantine zone, I saw soldiers dressed similar like us, wearing dark gear and gas masks attached to their heads. They were heavily guarding the entrance of the zone and patrolling the nearby area. A medical tent was set up not far from the troops, with both them and medical personnel present. To top it all off, there were a few heavy armored trucks situated right next to the guards, machine guns loaded on top, like the ones I had seen earlier. We all come up to the troops standing next to the entryway and our commander comes forward to talk to the guards. Pack 2 going in for the final scan? Understood. You are clear to move out. And be careful out there. We haven't heard from the last group that went in for a while. Acknowledged. We'll stay cautious. Our commander responds to the guard before the soldier unlocks the gate and radios of our arrival before we walk in. We stand in a shaded area where the sun's rays were unable to penetrate the thick branches above us. There is a dirt path leading deeper into the park which I knew would turn into a dirt trail if we went further. Aside from the path, there were no other buildings in sight and no real other direction to follow. Before we move forward, our captain reminds us that our objective is to explore our sector in the forest and check every single structure in the area until we reach the other side of the zone from where we would return to the main entrances and await further orders, if there are any. We follow the passage through the woods and eventually reaching a clearing where we could see a few wooden houses with one standing out from the rest containing two stories. All scattered across the field, we enter the small cabins first with nothing particularly special in them except for the furniture left behind by the owners. Next, we go to the bigger house where our actions become more ginger as we open the rusty door and hear its creaking echoes throughout the old house's insides. We moved in with our weapons close and ready to fire as we went from room to room. With the first floor empty, we went up the stairs to reach the second. The first room we saw had an open doorway with a hand peeking out at us. Out of instinct, someone in my group fired, but our commander quickly silenced us. As the view of the room itself became more clear, we saw that the arm belonged to a dead corpse of what we thought was the biter considering the black pools surrounding it, a bullet already implanted inside its chest. It wasn't long before we left the building and continued to explore the rest of the area. Aside from the occasional notifications we got of more squads entering the zone, the process repeated itself to the point where we were actually getting bored walking over sticks and dodging branches. As we moved out of a particularly crowded area, all of our radios suddenly burst into the life. Hello? Someone said in a panicked voice, shots ringing in the background. This is Pack 4 in the Midwest, requesting immediate reinforcements. We are close to the tall yellow building. 
spiders have overrun our... The voice stops as a blood-curdling screech can be heard in the background as all noise cuts off. After a moment of silence, the commander pulls out his radio and puts his mouth to it. Pack 4, can you give us your exact coordinates? No answer. Pack 4, do you copy? All available squadrons move into the Midwest area, the quarantine area. Keep an eye out for any signs of a yellow structure. The commander lowered his radio, taking out a pair of binoculars and began looking around. There, he says, pointing behind us. We turn and sure enough, behind the storm of branches, a yellow building just tall enough to stretch its neck over the woods is situated past the trees in front of us. We're probably the closest squad to them. If we hurry, we could probably make it. Come on! We ran past the twigs, slicing our faces, the mud below us sloshing under our boots as the building we were heading for kept getting bigger in size. The closer we got, the more clear the shouts and gunshots we heard up ahead. When we were close enough, we slowed down our run as we were carefully looking around the bushes, the sounds of struggle had ceased, and all that could be heard now was a low, deep growls. Even though I didn't want to believe it, my fears were confirmed when I took a glance out of my crouched position and saw bodies lying on the floor. The crossfire had stopped, and it looked like the biters had been victorious as they roamed the woods in front of us, some wearing military attire. A specific biter caught my attention, even from the back. I think he was in one of the cells at the same room I was in. His face slowly turned to face me and I swiftly hid behind a tree before he spotted me. I looked to the commander, who was motioning us to prepare to kill all the remaining biters. He began to count down from three, two, one... We all aimed our rifles at the closest target and fired. Momentarily stunned at the sudden attack, the biters immediately reacted and charged us. We continued to shoot off our rounds making sure to always have someone covering us when we were reloading. Our surprise attack couldn't last forever, as the vast numbers of the biters caught up to us. They all came down at us at once, and despite our best efforts to only shoot at the biters, our shots got caught in both the biter and our own squad member. With only a few managing to push the biters off them and land a bullet inside their heart, Suddenly, a figure jumped up behind the horde of biters and proceeded to gun down a large portion of the things storming towards us. His distraction allowed us to take out the remaining biters in view. However, a lone biter managed to break through his defense, tackling him to the floor. Just as the biter tore the M4 out of his hands and sharply pulled back its head for a fatal round into its back, causing its body to fall to the ground and go still. The figure pushes off the biter off of him, panting with dirt covered every inch of him. When he saw me, his face relaxed and he let out a laugh. I gave him a hand, which he grasped, and I helped him up. So now we're even, I say. Well, I guess we are, Carter replies. Someone shoots at the sky to see if the noise would attract any hidden biters as we hear more moans coming from inside the forest. As much as a touching reunion would be nice, we need to finish the task at hand. Do you know if any of your squad members are still alive? I don't think so. Most of them got bit and I saw a couple run farther into the woods, but I don't think any of them made it far. We checked if Carter had any bites or scratch marks, and he seemed to be in the clear. 
The commander decided to take him in, and we informed him of the mission. Things ran smoothly from there, and we briskly got past the few remaining standing biters. All up until we reached the end of the zone where we were preparing to head back. Hey, I think we missed a building, said Carter, as we all looked at what he was pointing to. A silver laboratory lay hidden within the trees with no sign of anybody already have been checked it. The remainder of the group strode to the front doors of the lab. It was locked and we didn't know if a few kicks would do it, so for some safe measure, one person from the group got the sledgehammer and eventually battered the door down. The feeling when we stepped inside was foreboding. The weak light of the exit sign barely illuminated the ominous reception area in front of us. We turned on our flashlight rifles to get a better view of our surroundings. As we got closer to the front desk, we saw what looked to be a nurse sprawled all over the floor. It was clear dried blood was flown down from her skull onto her white dress. There were two dim hallways on either side, and we all split up separating me from Carter. The doors were all closed, but not locked, like the front ones. We directed the muzzle of our guns at the handles of the nearby doors and carefully pulled it open. As soon as it was ajar, a biter in military gear crashed through, throwing himself on the wall. He grabbed the first person in arm's reach, and we instantaneously reacted and fired at the level of the biter's chest until he went limp. I reloaded as the commander and the others went to scan the room. I followed suit and went inside the room, finding a scientist laying on the floor with a glock line near his chest. We quickly examined the other rooms before moving on to the stairs. Our commotion had brought about more biters from the upper floor as we took on a couple of them tripping over the stairs and rolling down, breaking just about every remaining bone that was intact on their bodies. We boosted up the stairs before any other biters decided to investigate what was happening downstairs. When we reached the second floor, there were a few infected scientists just wandering around the labs maintaining their test rooms. When they saw us, they began shuffling towards us. The area that was persistently getting hit by the butt of my rifle began to throb as flashes emanated from my M4 and the biters fell one by one. Me and another person from my squad entered through a door leading to another office. My bright flashlight shone into the dark room, dust flying around. There didn't seem to be any biters or bodies on the floor so far, but we both decided to look around the room. I came up to the edge of the room and saw a desk with a piece of paper lying on it. When I took a closer look, I saw that it was not a document but a letter with crooked sentences hastily scribbled on it. I was going to ignore it when I saw three words that immediately caught my attention. Flesh biting virus. I promptly looked back when I saw something light up accompanied by two gunshots coming from the other room and something fell down with a loud thud. I looked back at the letter and after speedily looking it over noticed it was also explaining the origin and usage of the virus. I thought Lestings told us they didn't know where the origin of the virus came from. The commander started gathering everyone back and my other squad member in the room waved me over. I pushed away my doubt and pocketed the letter as I got up. Our commander gave us some brief checks before speaking. Come on, he announced. We are getting out of here. We all start heading down again and follow the dull red glowing coming from the end of the hallway. When we reached the door, we were flying to open it, taking in a fresh breath air. That breath is interrupted when we all hear someone making its way through some tall bushes. He finally emerges from a series of birch trees and I feel dread building up in my stomach. 
Its head was turned to an unnatural degree, with a dark red wound placed into his throat. One of his arms had been snapped off and was uselessly hanging there at his side. Parts of his lips were gone, and I thought one of his eyes was beginning to roll back into his head as well. Then, he turned to look at our group and he gazed at me. I couldn't help but feel the cold as the metal in my hands got heavier by the moment. Without a second thought, it screeched and dashed towards us. My finger laid on the trigger, but I couldn't make a move. The thing lurched at me as I heard gunfire and red holes appeared in his uniform. His body stopped mid-movement and was pushed backwards by the impact of the bullets. The anger faded from him as he fell and he looked at me with sad but in a way thankful eyes as Jared fell into the mud. When we finally reached the main entrance again, the sky was beginning to turn orange with the sun not far from the horizon. Tyler's group was already there when we got to the exit, and we exchanged a few words as they were getting checked for any signs of infection. We then got on our separate copters and flew back to the base. From what the commander told me, we were going to be released tomorrow, and for the time being, we would get our own private quarters as a means of thanking us. We were even allowed to go anywhere from the first to the second floor if we were feeling hungry or thirsty, but the third floor was strictly off-bounds. When we arrived, we took off our gear and we were taken to our designated rooms and told to contact any of the guards if need be. Once we were left alone, I chatted with Tyler and Carter as well as some other members in my group before I got some food and water and went back to my quarters. I placed everything on my desk and relaxed in a chair, thinking about what I would do when I was released. I heard something drop to the floor, and I saw it was a letter that I had taken from the facility. I picked it up and told myself, the do not disturb sign outside would do enough to at least buy me five or ten minutes to look through the letter. I skipped the parts about the procedures and what the virus does and began to read where it came from instead. Here's what it read. We're still not exactly sure where the virus originated from, but as we revisited the wide crater, we found that the substance inside it would have only been found from evidence to be proved it was coming from somewhere from deep space. Like I said, I didn't want to do those experiments anymore, but they still want to pinpoint where it came from, and the bonus was irresistible. But that's the least of my worries. Matt's still convinced we could use the substance to create an antivirus capable of curing at least one type of cancer. Even after all those years, He's still at it. Nobody leads it back to him, but he's as careless as ever. Do you know what happens when the substance is transferred into a person's bloodstream? Imagine what the scale of another outbreak would be if it got out of hand. I have to go now. Matt's doing something. I promise I'll visit as soon as I can. Say hello to the others for me. Mark. By the time I finished reading, I was in a state between confused and boiling. Sure, this might be all fake, but they said they would indicate the virus after the outbreak was suppressed. And after all, they were still lying to us? I don't know exactly why I went to Professor Lestings first, but it seemed like the only logical thing to do since he was the one that knew most about the virus. Most of the doors in my hallway also had the same do not disturb sign like I did, and during my walk to Lestings, I only saw a few faces aside from the guards. When I got to Lestings' office, a couple of guards were standing next to his door and asked me what I was doing there. I told them. I told them I needed to speak with Lestings, and one of them gave me a sort of pat check before they let me in. The professor was sitting at his desk, frowning his brows as he intently read what looked to be another document. Um... I coughed as he looked up at me and gives me a smile. 
Ah, you must be Brad. Come sit. I only need one chair. He beacons me to a seat in front of his desk. The armchair is soft, and my tension gives out as I slosh deeper into it. So, is there anything I can help you with? Uh, yes. Yes, Professor. Remember how you mentioned that you didn't know where this virus came from? I continued it as he gave me his attention. Well, during our mission, I found this letter that states exactly that. His face turns from serious to bewildered. Brad, my administration was aware of no such thing. Do you still have that document? Perhaps the information was falsified. With just a little hesitation, I handed him over the letter. He gave it a rough inspection, and after a few moments, he lowered it from his face and thanked me for delivering the letter to him. You better get going now. Go get some sleep. You're going to have to look sharp for them to release you, he laughs. I'll take a look at this. And with that, I stand up, stretch my back before turning around and walking towards the door. Click. I heard something come from behind me. I turned around and saw the professor holding a handgun, pointing it right at my forehead. Later, he said with a smile. Professor, what are you doing? Well now, we couldn't allow you to just walk away with all this. It would compromise everything. What are you talking about? This all ends tomorrow. Everyone will hear. Ah, but no, it doesn't. You can't even begin to understand what you're dealing with, boy. This virus has the potential to wipe out all diseases on Earth. Imagine living the life of fame, becoming the most prominent billionaire in the world, and having someone like you being the last obstacle in your path. You're freaking madman. A rich madman, to be precise, he said with a sinister chuckle. I always insisted my walls should be soundproof. Just before he pulls the trigger, something falls from the desk and bumps onto the ground. He looks to where the noise came from, and I take the chance to charge him. Now, even though this guy is nearing his retirement age, he still has the fight of the strength to put up a challenge. I take him down and land a punch to his nose, watching him howl in pain. He holds up his arms near his face as I try to break his defense, but he holds off long enough to shove his fist up my gut. As we continue to exchange blows, he dodges me well enough to not lose the pistol, but I attack him often enough for him not to have a chance to use it. I use my left wrist to block an incoming hit, but nearly falls sidewards as he uses the butt of his gun to swing at my skull. Before he gets the chance to aim, I thrust my knuckles near his liver. He recoils, and I expect him to fall, but he lifts his leg and kicks my knee with all his force. Out of instinct, I grab his shirt and throw him hurtling against the wall. I heard another snap as the professor defeatedly slumps to the floor. I began to approach his broken figure when I notice he's smiling, a sick, deteriorated smile. He lifts up his pistol and I hear a defeating clack. Something sharp pierces my skin and I drop to the ground, piercing myself against the wall as my vision blurs and my ears ring. What in holy hell is going on here? I think I hear Harper exclaim as he bursts in through the door with guards rushing in. A figure hurriedly comes up to me and kneels to my face and I realize it's the chief. He's talking and pleading with me, but I can't make out what he's saying. I see Lestings having his weapon taken away from him and detaining by guards and medical personnel. As he's being taken away, he manages to get close enough to whisper one last thing to give me sleepless nights. I see the chief being pulled away and the doctor running up to me before everything goes dark. I wake up in the hospital with the nurse standing beside me. She reveals the bullet had hit one of my vitals, which provoked a lot of blood loss and explained 
why I had blacked out so quickly. She also told me that the doctors barely managed to remove the bullet and stabilize me in time, and that they would have to keep me in the hospital for a while. Before anyone was allowed to see me, I had some agents visit me that made me sign some federal agreements and give me my phone back. Once they cleared out, I had Carter and some of my other family and friends there visit me. They never asked me how I got shot, but it was still nice to catch up. From what I was told from Carter, when the professor was questioned, he made up some bull about how I got mad he wasn't giving out private information and how he used the gun to defend himself when I attacked him. Half of the cameras in the building were suspiciously inactive during our conversation and with no one to back either one of us up with concrete evidence, we were let off the hook and he had disappeared before anyone else could get to him. Eventually, I was released and I drove back to the nostalgic atmosphere of my neighborhood. When I got back to my house, I could say I was ready to lead a normal life again without Logan and Jack. But there was still something that made me look over my shoulder every once in a while. Something that occasionally gives me nightmares I wake up from in a cold sweat. That virus is still out there. If another outbreak happens, we may not be so lucky. We might not be able to stop it. And that will be our last mistake. I know I shouldn't be telling this to everyone, but after staying silent for so long, everyone needs to know what they're up against. All I hope is that the virus is locked away deep inside a hidden place that is never coming back to the face of the earth. But if it does, well then the professor's words weren't in vain. Because after all, I can't stop the inevitable. Amid other middle-class houses, autumn foliage, and a smoking, burnt-out Honda Accord, there stood an unassuming white stucco house. And inside of this modest house, Todd Black, middle-aged, overweight, sweaty, sat in a recliner and studied the screen of his laptop, absorbed in a chess match that he was losing to a computer opponent. Todd jumped when a woman's scream broke the silence and his concentration. Grumbling, he moved the TV tray, holding his laptop aside, and left the comfort of his recliner to approach the boarded-up living room window. Holding the pink gossamer curtain out of the way, he peeked through the space of two boards and spotted the source of the scream. Cradling a wounded arm, a disheveled young woman in a denim jacket hurried down the sidewalk on the opposite side of the street. Somebody help me, she yelled. Slack-jawed and breathing through his mouth, Todd observed the cemetery corpses that pursued the woman. They shambled due to the degraded state of their muscles and joints, but were carried along by a preternatural hunger that allowed them to keep pace with their living prey. Todd mentally counted the dead. One, two, three, four, five. Please, someone help, the woman hollered. She kept looking back to the ghouls as she scrambled along the sidewalk. Todd glanced back at his handgun lying on the coffee table. Not worth the risk. The woman, distracted by the group at her heels, did not notice two more of the living dead step out from behind a privacy fence, about a yard ahead of her. She plowed into one and tumbled with him to the sidewalk. She found herself on top of the dead man's chest with her right hand in his abdomen. Freeing her hand, she resumed screaming at the sight of the globby putrefaction covering her fingers. The still-standing zombie, female with long, matted hair and dressed in an earth-stained black dress, descended upon the woman, and while the living woman struggled to escape the dead woman's hold, the other zombies caught up. 
They joined in, ripping with bony hands and tearing with rotted teeth her warm, tender flesh. Todd let the curtain fall back into place and returned to his recliner. As the young woman continued to scream, he plopped down and scooched the TV tray back in place. He moved his index finger to the enter key so that he might resume his losing chess game, but let his finger hover. He glanced over to the framed picture of his wife, Kara. You stupid woman, I told you not to leave. He's all alone, Todd, she said in that plaintive tone that singed his nerves. Someone will help him, Kara. You're not obligated. You're a nurse, not his daughter. He felt his words developing sharper edges. Who will help him? He has no family, and we both know the police are no help. At the mention of the police, Todd could not help but think of his neighbor, Paul Devich. Two days earlier, Todd had watched from inside his house as a police officer mistook the hard of hearing elderly man's non-compliance at the demand that he turn around as confirmation that Mr. Devich was a zombie and then shot him dead. We're his only chance, Todd, Kara insisted. Todd sighed. It's not worth the risk. He sensed his fuse nearing its end. I already told you, I'm not taking the chance. We need to stay here and wait this out. It's the best option. Please, Todd, help me. We'll hurry and get him and come right back. She pleaded with her eyes. He's all alone, she reminded him. Kara persisting in the face of his clear disagreement was like dripping his already lit fuse in gasoline. Go, Kara. Go get him, he said, his words a rage-fueled staccato. But I want you to know you'll be leaving me all alone. Kara flashed him a grimace, a grimace that would have been at home on the face of a grave robber discovering a rodent mother and her young nestled inside a corpse, and then turned towards the front door. Without another word, she unlocked the deadbolt and the doorknob, opened the door, and walked out into the quiet dawn, closing the door behind her. Todd, a fleshy furnace radiating hate, clenched his fists as Kara's minivan started up and sped away. A whole day had passed since Kara had left. With all wired and wireless communication not working, which Todd was certain was the doing of Everett Canyon, the defense contractor that virtually held the deed to the city and was undoubtedly responsible for the monsters that were besieging it. Todd enjoyed no easy means of contact with Kara, short of leaving his refuge and making the more than a mile trek to Harold Clemming's home, and he wasn't going to do that, especially after the carnage he'd witnessed out front. No, Todd was doing exactly what he should do, Sit tight, play it safe, and wait for Everett Cannon to send in commandos to clean up this mess. He pressed the enter key to resume his chess game. Down to his king, queen, a bishop, and a few pawns, the computer's advantage in pieces made Todd's loss a foregone conclusion. He persisted for a couple more moves, but resigned in frustration at the loss of his queen. An autumn breeze had developed, and Todd listened as it whistled through the various entry points in his old house. He couldn't tell for certain, but he thought he could still hear, mingled with the wind, the moans of the ghouls who had ended the young woman on the sidewalk. This was a lonely sound, and it accentuated Todd's sense of isolation. I miss you, Kara, but I made the right choice, damn it. I wish you were still here, but you just had to be so stubborn. If only I could have made you see that you were throwing your life away for a relative stranger. A new sound suddenly joined the wind, the patter of raindrops on window panes. And then, as if at the direction of Mother Nature's conducting baton, thunder suddenly rounded out the ensemble. 
Spurred by curiosity, Todd returned to the living room window to observe the zombies. Out in the twilight rain, which had already turned into a downpour, the group that had killed the young woman earlier was now joined by their partially devoured victim, a beneficiary of whatever lab-made microbe or chemical was responsible for this whole ordeal. Seemingly heedless of the weather, the creatures did not abandon each other to dash for the nearest cover, but instead stood together in the rain like hungover sentinels. They're like one big family, Todd thought, and then discarded the idea in disgust. They're nothing more than automatons driven by an appetite for flesh, he decided. And the only reason they're not doing anything now is that they haven't sent the nice morsel in the White House across the street. He returned to the recliner and grabbed his handgun from the coffee table. He hefted it and took a small pleasure in its weight and solidity. A thump on the living room window intruded on his reverie and nearly caused him to discharge the handgun by accident. Reluctantly, gun still in hand, he made his way to the window and carefully stepped over a pair of his tennis shoes that sat between him and the source of the thump. Breathing heavily, he peered through the boards and discovered who was beating on the window. It was Kara. Her bestial and degraded appearance unmanned him, and he retreated backwards in small, jerky steps. In this state of shock, he tripped over the tennis shoes he had just stepped over and tumbled violently to the floor, and this time, his gun did discharge. Despite the mind-numbing pain of his wound, Todd understood the extent of his injury. The bullet, he could see, had entered the right side of his abdomen, and had, the wetness of his shirt informed him, exited his lower back. He knew that he would die. Just before the dread of non-existence could fully take hold, Kara pounced again on the glass. Teeth gritted, Todd glanced in her direction. He thought of the young woman's initiation into the shambling dead. Would he actually prefer that type of existence over potential nothingness? The notion of sharing a fate with his wife and having her again at his side somewhat tempered his revulsion of the creatures outside. I'm joining the family, Kara, he hollered as he began to shift his weight to make his way to the door. He winced but fought through the pain, sustained by the manic determination of a man with nothing left to lose. Resting his shoulder against the wall, he unlocked the deadbolt and doorknob and swung the door open. Lightning flashed, illuminating the neighborhood for a split second. Todd rounded the doorframe until he was leaning against the exterior of the house. The rain was cold, but he knew he would not mind soon enough. Hi, babe. Kara began to shuffle towards him. I need you to share your gift, Kara. Come on, hun. Just one little bite. Kara stretched out her arms and grasped Todd. With what was left of his diminishing strength, Todd held her face and resisted to prevent her from getting too carried away. He guided her chomping teeth to his shoulder, and with some hesitance, allowed her to sink into his flesh. He screamed at the fire in his shoulder and pushed her away. Out of the corner of his eye, Todd noticed the other ghouls advancing towards him. Already halfway across his lawn, they were quickly closing in. Not willing to part with any more of his person, Todd twisted to retreat inside. This hasty movement contorted his wound, and he collapsed in blinding agony. He pushed away the pain as best he could and began to crawl towards the entryway, but a cold hand grasped his ankle and halted his progress. It was Kara, of course, and she began to crawl up his legs. Kicking did not deter Kara, and she took a considerable chunk out of Todd's thigh. Despite his protestations, Kara continued to glutton herself. The rest of the dining party arrived, and testing deteriorated muscles and joints to crouch down, they joined in. You're eating too much, 
Todd tried to howl, but the words came out in a barely audible whimper. Not that this mattered, the dead would have ignored him either way. They proceeded to bite, tear, and rip without any concern over those parts their victim most hoped to keep intact. Unfortunately for Todd, once the dead had finished, they'd left nary a cell that might contain any semblance of his consciousness. Finally, doctors found a cure for the common cold. Parents all over the United States are taking their children to get this life-changing vaccine. You, however, do not have children and have always had a strong immune system. Therefore, you decide you do not need this new vaccine, but you cannot help but pay attention to the commercials. Don't you hate that sick feeling you get from the cold? Could you believe a simple shot could make you forever? Could you believe a simple shot could make you forget about this forever? This vaccine has been tested again and again to ensure your safety and wellness. Side effects may include extreme drowsiness, mood swings, and swelling of the lower eyelids. Temporary side effects are nausea, dizziness, and loss of coordination. After receiving the vaccine, you should not drive or operate heavy machinery for at least three days. Typically, but nothing extraordinary. You glance at the clock near the television. It's 7.34 a.m. You are going to be late for work as a janitor at the local public elementary school. You slip on your shoes, grab your backpack off the couch, and make your way to the garage. On your way, you see the mailman at the mailbox. You always BS with him. He has been your mailman for over 12 years. He tells you that he was thinking about getting his son vaccinated. It is not shocking. It seems to be all over the news and the topic of choice for parents. You politely tell him that you will talk with him tomorrow. When you arrive at the school, you slip on your headphones and begin to sweep the floors. And begin to sweep the floors. You do not look up at any students. Why would you? Why would you care? Time passes and you leave the building after disinfecting every desk and scrubbing every sink in every bathroom. You open the back door and walk to your car. Rage pours through your veins as you see that the windshield of your car has been smashed. You look around and see a boy. He may have been in fourth or fifth grade. He tilts his head forward and raises his eyebrows. You wonder why he makes this face, and then it hits you. His lower eyelids are extremely swollen. You want to confront him but decide to let him go. There is nothing he can do for you. Tomorrow, you will simply park in the hospital parking lot on the other side of the street. You watch the boy slowly, tiredly walk away. After about seven steps, he leans up against the brick wall that he was walking next to. You open your driver's side door sweep some broken glass from the seat, drive home, and go to sleep. Your alarm clock battery died. You walk into the living room and squint at the clock near your television. It is 8.04 a.m. Great, you're already late and you haven't even brushed your teeth. You get ready and arrive at work. Your boss, a fifth grade English teacher, wants to speak with you. You walk into his class and notice that all of the children are either slouching in their seats or sleeping with their heads on the desk. He tells you how unacceptable it is for you to be coming in late so often and made you promise that it will never happen again. Then he excuses you. You walk towards the door but have your eyes glued to the puffy eyelids of the children. 
A boy in the front row began snoring on his desk, clutching a sharpened pen, pencil, and eraser. You see the teacher nudge the boy and ask him to stay awake. The boy's face twists as he stabs the teacher in the heart with the pencil. You try to scream, but you are frozen in shock. Only two words flash in your mind. Mood swings. None of the students seem to have noticed what just happened before their eyes. You suddenly gain control of your body and scream for help. This angers the children, whose faces now portray extreme hatred. Some of them charge you with energy you would expect from fifth graders, and others just limp towards you like zombies. Their eyes were glued shut with pus, but somehow they knew just where you were. You run down the hallways, screaming uncontrollably. As you look to your left and right into other classrooms, you see blood everywhere. You do not know what had happened, but you continue to scream. The children from the other rooms begin to chase you in a similar fashion as those behind you. Some of them cover their ears. You realize that your scream is angering them. You decide to stop, but you cannot. Children are coming from everywhere. There is nowhere left to run. There are no adults around other than you. You try to decide what to do, but then you noticed blood streaming down your arm. A child has bitten your shoulder and is still holding on. The others see this and begin biting you too. You are panicking, but the sea of children has surrounded you. You notice that the students have begun lifting and carrying desks, similarly to how rock stars would surf a crowd. A girl near you smashes it against your head. You should have seen that coming. You think as you fall to the ground. The children begin to slowly tear the skin off of your face and body with their teeth and nails. After a few hours, the pain kicks in as you slowly die of blood loss. If only you could get to the building on the other side of the street. I quietly look through the window, peeking through the cracks of the wood that had been nailed shut from the inside. I stare at the emptiness that surrounds me. It's been so long now, I don't even know what year it really is. It could be 2020, 2021, I have no idea. The last I recalled, it was close to Halloween of 2019 when it happened. I'm not sure the reasons, but I remember hearing the newscasts about it when it first erupted, saying that North Korea actually bombed us with some virus. The virus that spread like butter. From San Diego to New York, New York, and down south and all around. All cell phone service, electricity, and any type of energy had ceased to work after about the first three days since contact. That means I'm SOL. I live in Nampa, Idaho, and I'm grateful that I'm from here when this had happened because I know one thing, the dead don't last in the winter. Now, I'm not saying that it snows like a mother where I'm at, but my area is surrounded by super huge mountains and they're loaded with snow for at least four to five months, which helps, except for the locals. I'll get to that later. I live on North Timberlake Place. I won't give the exact address because I still fear some of the living. But those of you local or on the road just finding a place to stay and need somewhere safe, come find me. I've spray painted safe house on the front of the house. 
and you'll notice that everything is boarded up and very tightly secured. It is safe here. There are three of us here currently. We are heavily armed, and we have plenty of food. We make weekly runs into Boise. You know, first aid kits, water, canned foods, and anything and everything we could get our hands on, including weapons and ammunition. And when it comes to melee, yeah, we get down with the bats and crowbars too. After everything had went down, I avoided contact with everyone. I just wanted to be left alone, especially from the walkers. It was perfectly fine for me. I'm an introvert anyways. I find ways to keep myself busy and proactive. When it all went down, it took me quite a few days to gather up all the wood from stealing it from the neighbors' yards. It's not like they were going to be missing it. After all the windows were taken care of, the front door was the next project. I installed a nice little 2x4 that could go across the center of the door. You know, something like from medieval times. But it works. And I'll be honest, I'm not much of a gun person. But I did make sure to visit the ammunition shop when I was in town last week. Unfortunately, there wasn't much left over, as I'm not the only smart person, obviously. I did happen to come across a couple 9mm and plenty of mags to go around. There was other stuff in there, but honestly, I was only interested in something lightweight that I could carry with me for long periods of time. I could always go back for more, but for right now, that's all I need. At my house, I already had a ninja sword. I know, cliche, right? Just call me Michonne from The Walking Dead. No, hers was a samurai sword. Mine was ninja. It just means it's a little bit shorter. But mine was full tang. That means that the metal blade runs through the length of the handle, creating a stronger, more balanced weapon. You get the idea now. I was able to find a leather chest strap for one of the nines. That means I didn't have to be a dumbass and have it in my pocket or tucked into my belt. Back in the garage, a lot of things get customized when it comes to melee. From bats with nails in them to spikes, you name it. We even customize hockey sticks, and I know that sounds really odd, but it works. I have a typical three-bedroom house but I have an additional 1,200 square foot underground in my basement, which is where it's more safe to make noise. This is my safe house, and you're welcome to join us. If you're listening to this on the other end of the radio, please find us. I truly feel that being alone is not the way to survive. It's something that works temporarily, but honestly, numbers count. It's always good to have some real friends to rely on. The others with me, their names are Ben and Mike. They're both around the same age as I. We'll not get into that. But they're very nice people. One is from the same area as myself, but the other one is from San Diego. Hell, the world's ending and they still keep coming up here. I met Ben through the radio transactions just like I'm doing here with you right now. Mike... I found in town when I was doing my weekly runs. At first, I almost shot his ass thinking he was a walker, but when he spoke to me, I knew he was alive. You do have to be very careful of who you associate with, as some of the people that are still left around are not very kind-hearted. They're very territorial and they always want to take everybody else's shit, so you gotta protect yourself at all costs at all times. So I sit here, looking through the window between the cracks of the floorboards that are nailed to the window seal, staring at the dead walkers, not noticing that I'm here, not noticing that their next meal is being unnoticed. The only thing that worries me is what's to happen once the city is all drained out, when there's no more bottled water. When there's no more food, no more canned food, no more ammunition, when there's nothing left, then what? Do I start into cannibalism against the dead? Do I start 
eating them like they're trying to eat me? Or do I move? If I move, where? Do I head north? I know they don't do too well in the cold. Maybe Montana. Or maybe I'll head up north to Canada. I don't want to leave my house. This place is 100% zombie proof. It's a very strong structure, and I've built it to last. I guess I could just start making longer trips for my weekly runs. Yes, that is what's going to end up happening until there's some type of change. If there's change. I laid the radio down next to the table by the window. I got up to stretch my feet and I walked over towards the bedroom door. I open it and walk into the hallway towards the living room. I wanted to grab something out of the kitchen as I was fiending for some beans. I know it doesn't sound like much, but you get a chance to get some cold refried beans with a spoon and you'll dig right in if you're starving. Ugh. I'm almost out of cigarettes again, Ben said, looking down at his smoke in his fingers as he stared into the backyard. It's okay. We're going to be making our rounds here in a couple of hours anyways. We'll make sure and grab a pack or two once we get there. A pack or two? Shoot, maybe a carton or two. Heck, we only do this once a week. <laughs> I open the back sliding glass door. I lean down, and I grab a beer from inside of the snow. Heck... Who needs a fridge anyways these days? I thought to myself. I sipped on my Corona walking down the hallway. I stopped at Mike's room. I saw that he was loading up his backpack getting ready for the next run into the city. You just about ready to go? I asked him. Yep, ready when you are, he replied. I gave him the motion to follow me and I walked towards the front door. Grabbing Ben's attention, I told him, Let's go, dude. It's time. All three of us left the house and got into the truck, started up the engine, and headed our way into town. It was about a 20-minute drive east on Highway 84. It would have took a lot less, but we tend to drive slower because we are avoiding traffic if you catch my drift. Abandoned cars laid in every direction, along with the dead swarming all around. Usually, we would pull over and try to take the gas out of some of the abandoned vehicles, but there was more walkers out than usual today. We finally reached our destination on 16th Street over at Albertsons. We parked the truck really close to the entrance. It's the fastest way to get in and out at a quick pace. We all looked around our surroundings before we all exited the truck and headed towards the front doors. Okay guys, now remember, let's make this quick. We know what we're looking for, so let's just stick to the plan. And make sure, if you come across any walkers, try to avoid them. But if you can't, use a melee weapon. Try not to use a gun, as it will attract too much attention. And unwanted attention is exactly what we don't need right now while we're trying to find food to survive. They both nodded their head in agreement, and we all proceeded to walk inside. There was dead walkers all over the place. A couple of them turned our way and started dragging themselves in our direction. Luckily, they're too slow, so by the time they even reached us, we were already well inside. But it doesn't end there. While you're inside trying to gather food and supplies, you're usually never alone. <sighs> One of the walkers grabbed Ben and he yanked himself away and shot his gun at it. The walker bled and fell to the ground. Dead for the second time, I suppose. Yeah, but this time it's final, Ben replied. After we found all the supplies and food that we needed and could muster up at the moment, we headed back towards the direction of the front entrance towards our truck. Unfortunately, there were things in our way. 
There were at least 20 walkers banging on the glass door trying to enter towards us. Ah, shit. How the hell are we supposed to get to our truck now? Mike said. I have an idea, but I need a volunteer. Neither one of them volunteered, of course, so I laid out my plan and made Ben just do it anyways. Hell, my house, my rules. Fast forward about ten minutes worth of griping and complaining and pointing fingers, Ben ended up doing as was told. He secretly crept out one of the side doors of the shop and made a bunch of noise, screaming and getting all the attention of the walkers that were blocking us from the truck. They all started going in his direction as he banged trash cans with a metal stick. Get over here, you stupid little ugly fuckers! Come on! Over here! Yeah! You! With the saggy titties! Come on over here! There's some juicy meat over here! I don't know what it was about Ben, but whenever he got wild, his southern accent totally came out. Which doesn't make any sense, because he's not even from the south. But it worked. The walkers started going in his direction, and he walked at a slow pace towards them. Slowly, Mike and I shuffled to the truck, got inside, and started up the engine. Some of the walkers noticed us in the background because we had turned the vehicle on. It didn't matter to us, we would just run those little bastards over. We made a big U so that we could pick up Ben from the other side of where the walkers were coming from. Unfortunately, we weren't there fast enough. As Ben was so occupied trying to get the attention of the 20 plus walkers that were blocking the truck from us, he wasn't paying attention to his surroundings, as about three walkers had grabbed him from behind, biting into his neck and arms and pulling him to the ground as he screamed. No! We screamed, but there was nothing we could do. It was too late. He was already gone. Oh, Ben. I'm so sorry. I wish we could have gotten there faster. We could only watch for so long. There was just so much blood. We didn't bother sticking around to grab his ammunition and whatever goods he had put in his pockets. Out of respect, we just turned the truck around and started heading back to the safe house. This is the daily risk that anyone left has to accept and acknowledge that is a part of life now. It could happen to any one of us. You must be on your guard 24-7 when you're outdoors. So there we were, one man down, tears dripping from our cheeks, as we headed back home to our safe house with lots of bags of goodies in the bed of the truck. I'd give it all back to have Ben, but it's too late now. It's all my fault, I said out loud to myself. No, it's not. The plan was just as good as anybody's. Ben wasn't paying attention. It's on him, not you, Mike replied. I knew Mike was right. It just still felt so wrong. The stress was so heavy on my shoulders, it was hard to drive straight. I had about a half a tank of gas left, which was plenty to get home but I knew that the next run we would have to siphon some of the nearby vehicles. It's not a big deal. It's just kind of nasty when you have to do it by hose and mouth. But it is what it is. We had finally reached back to the safe house, unloaded the truck, and got inside and locked everything behind us in the tracks. After everything was put away in its proper place, I cracked open a beer and handed one over to Mike, and then opened one for myself and we clicked bottles before we chugged. Let me get one of your smokes, 
I asked Mike. I was incredibly stressed out. I mean, he was too, but I just felt so responsible for what had happened to Ben, regardless of what Mike said in response. So here I sit, smoking my cigarette, drinking my beer, staring out my glass window through the cracks of the wooden boards that have been nailed shut, waiting. I'll update soon, when something else occurs, but as of now, it's just the same routine. Survival. Over the last year, I had finally achieved one of my main dreams in life and moved to California. I hail from a little shithole town in Georgia. It took me quite some time to scrape together the cash I needed to escape hillbilly hell. Although, knowing what I know now, I would have never made this move. My name's Cyrus, and this is my nightmare. So after uprooting everything and finally moving to the Golden State, I had a bit of a rough time finding work. I was starting to get really nervous that I was going to have to pack it all up and head back home. After moving expenses and everything was done and set, I only had enough money to survive two months max without work. Eventually I lucked out and did find employment through a hospital. I would be working overnights. During training a couple of my fellow employees called it the graveyard shift. The job was simple. I was to report to work every night at 10pm. After punching in I would head to the employee quarters. From there I would collect my clipboard and my company cell phone. And then all I had to do was wait for the phone to ring. So you're probably wondering what exactly the job I'm performing is. I'm a transporter of sorts. My cargo? Corpses. Whenever someone dies in the hospital, it's my job to go and collect the body. It's not terrible, and dead things never really bothered me. I think the worst thing about the job is when bodies kind of move on their own. I've gone on Reddit and made sure that I'm not crazy. This does happen sometimes. The movement's usually minor. For example, I'll get the box that I move the cadavers in downstairs, and their legs will be crossed. Or there's been a few times as I'm sliding them into the metal slabs for the freezer door of the morgue, and I'll turn around to do something, and when I come back, one of their arms is hanging out from underneath the cloth. The internet claims this is muscle memory. I claim it's creepy as shit. I think the worst thing that ever happened with this kind of situation was the time one sat up on me. It was an elderly gentleman who had passed. I got my routine phone call, and I went to pick him up. It happened right as I walked into the room. So usual protocol for when someone dies is when the family has left, you pull a sheet over them. So in case somebody enters their room, that's the universal sign for this patient is no longer with us. As I entered the room, the body was in an upright position. The sheet was still covering it, but you could tell it was sitting up. So the general rule of thumb is when I'm going to pick up a body, they lay the body flat. That way I can slide it over from the bed right into my metal box. Although a tad awkward, the process is usually quick and painless. Seeing the body like that caught me off guard. So I went out to the hallway and grabbed the nurse who had been taking care of that room. I awkwardly asked her to confirm the name and birth date of the deceased patient. She seemed rather confused as we had just been through this a few minutes before I had entered the room. I then proceeded to explain to her what I walked in on. She looked rather concerned when I explained I had found the body in an upright sitting position. The nurse quickly stepped around me and entered the room. I followed her into the room. I was met with a sour gaze and her hands were on her hips. She asked me in a frustrated voice if I was some kind of funny guy. She then proceeded to ask who had put me up to this sick joke. I was confused at first, but then I looked at the bed where the patient had been sitting. The corpse was now laying flat, the way all bodies are when I come to pick them up. The nurse gave me a scowl as she walked out of the room and mentioned that I was twisted. I wanted to protest, but at this point it didn't matter. The only other thing that really freaks me out about my job is when the corpses moan. Let me explain though, because I know what it sounds like. Sometimes when someone dies, uh, they have air trapped in their lungs. And when you move the body right or pressure is applied to the body in a certain way, the air will escape the lungs and it comes out in a moaning sound. Luckily, on-the-job training explains this, because if I had moved somebody and they moaned after I knew they were dead, I think I would have shit myself. So it used to be on a standard shift for my job, I would move one, maybe two bodies max a night. Ever since this new virus came out though, I'm moving five to six bodies a night, sometimes seven on the weekends. Now those numbers are quite alarming, as California is a big state, but... It's not only the number of bodies I'm moving, but the age of the deceased. 
Now, majority of the time, the deceased I move are usually elderly, and when they're not elderly, it's only because they usually were in a car accident or something very fatal. Lately, I've been moving a lot of people my age, and it, it kind of really messes me up, I'm not going to lie. The virus that's afflicting the population originated overseas. The protocol at my job had changed after this virus was discovered. So lately, work has me take extra precaution while moving those who have been done in by the virus. So usually when I pick up a body, I take it down to the morgue. I place it in the freezer, where it waits for the mortician to show up to do the autopsy. But ever since the virus had launched, my orders have changed. We no longer hold the bodies in the morgue. After someone passes, a nurse makes a special phone call to a company, at which point I get a phone call next. I pick up the deceased in my metal box and I wheel them down to the doors of the shipping and receiving dock, at which point I'm met by somebody wearing a hazmat suit. They hand me a clipboard to fill out while they take my metal box into the back of a refrigerated truck. The company's name is Zek Tech. What it stands for, I don't know. All I can tell you is the company spells its name as Z. E. C. K. I've googled it and all it comes up with is links to other sites about corporate cleanup. The whole situation's weird, but it's none of my business. And seeing as I have rent to pay, I'm not questioning it. It's been about a month now since this virus hit. Before my nights were riddled with body transfers, I used to spend a lot of my free time on Reddit. I enjoy the occasional conspiracy theory as well as Reddit has a lot of information you won't find in other places. Tonight, work happened to start off slow. So while scrolling down my main page, I happened upon a thread that was picking up a lot of speed. The title of the thread was The Dead Shall Walk. I invested some time in reading it. The original poster had claimed that a family member of his who was under quarantine who had symptoms of the virus had passed away. After saying their goodbyes, they had closed off the family member's room, where at that point they had waited for the coroner to arrive. When opening the door for the coroner to collect the body, they were met with the surprising factor that the family member was up and about. At that point, the coroner had panicked and urged the family to leave the room immediately. The original poster didn't see much, just that their grandmother had been standing and looking out the window. They only caught a glimpse of her as they were rushed out of the room by the panicked family members. Other users began to comment on the thread, saying that they had heard or seen similar things. What the community had come to as a whole was that those who would die by the virus do not stay dead. Now this left me feeling a bit uneasy, but it made me start to really wonder if there was something to this. Ever since people started dying from this virus, we haven't been storing the bodies here. Not to mention, they're out of here within an hour of their death. Now the original poster never posted a time limit as to how long it would take for a corpse to reanimate. According to different users in the comments section, it's anywhere from 2 to 4 hours. It was about an hour into my shift when my phone finally rang. As usual, I gathered up my belongings, I put on a fresh pair of gloves, and I grabbed the handles of the big metal box and rolled out. I arrived upstairs to pick up my passenger, and the halls were empty. All the nurses, CNAs, and other workers were all gathered around the main nursing station. They were all watching a news report on a computer screen. I myself was never one for the news. Maybe you can blame it on my age. Majority of the time, though, they report the same six stupid things in different orders, and they're just like, If you're just joining us back now, Thanks for the update, Chuck. Back to you, Mord11. It all just comes off as stupid rubbish to me. I announced that I was here to pick up said room and asked for the nurse to step forward. She broke away from the crowd, but she never turned her neck towards me. Her gaze was always focused on that computer screen. I muttered under my breath, Geez, if I didn't know any better, I'd be standing in a room full of zombies. The nurse signed my clipboard and then slowly walked back to the group. I then turned around, grasped my box, put one of my hands up and said have a good night with a nonchalant wave. I headed into the room, I did the slide by myself and put the patient in the box. This was a depressing night. The girl I was picking up was around my age and was extremely beautiful. It was marked down in her paperwork that she was suffering from virus symptoms. I stopped for a moment and thought about all the things in life she'd never get to do, and I promised myself I'd start living just a little more. After I got her loaded up, I sealed the box and I headed out. I then followed new protocol and I headed towards the doors of the shipping and receiving docks. Oddly though, once I had arrived, no one was there to greet me. For the last month, ever since I've picked up a corpse, there's always been someone to meet me right at the door. I phoned the floor and asked to speak to the nurse who had signed the paperwork for me. She told me she had followed through on her end, and she'd even called Zectec before I got there. This was really unlike Zectec. They were really on point about this, so for them not to be here was kind of concerning. With no options left, I decided to phone my boss. He told me he would look into it in the morning when he came in, but for now just place the body in the morgue freezer. To be safe, I waited five more minutes, just in case Zectech was running behind. You know, they could have had a busy night. Time passed, and no one showed up, so I took the body back to the freezer like my boss had told me. Once I arrived back in the morgue, I set up the paperwork and I started filing it away. Anytime someone's placed in the freezer, you gotta do paperwork. 
I began to zone out as I started the filing process, when suddenly a loud thud had broken me out of my trance. Nothing in the room looked any different, but I decided to go and check on my metal box I had stored the cadaver in. I slowly and hesitantly opened the lid of the box. I, th I think I was imagining things because the body had moved. When I placed her in the box, I put her on her back. Upon opening the box, she was laying on her side. Call it muscle memory maybe, but this is the weirdest case I've ever seen. I decided right then and there I was going to load her in the freezer because I was notably freaked out. After getting her on ice and finishing my paperwork, I had sat down at my computer. I was getting ready to scroll Reddit when all of a sudden the power flickered in the hospital. A few minutes went by and it flickered again, but this time it had gone out. Lucky for us, the hospital has emergency generators, but they only power the most essential things. Sadly, the morgue in my office aren't one of them. Right after the power outage, the PA system started its loud chirp, letting us know a message was going to be played throughout the entire hospital. Attention all staff, I repeat, attention all staff, this is not a drill, code purple. I ended up having to check my badge because I wasn't really familiar with the codes as we never really deal with anything important at night. Code purple, threat inside the hospital, find cover. What the hell was going on? I pulled out my phone and was getting ready to scroll the news media looking for some kind of information on maybe what was happening. Before I got that far, I was distracted by a scream down the hall. I grabbed the flashlight off my desk and I burst into the hall. I was so confused there shouldn't even be anybody in this wing of the hospital. I began to sprint down the hall from where the scream had echoed. As I ran, my mind began to race. What was happening? Was this in any way connected to what those nurses were watching on the computer? A few moments later, I stopped in my tracks. There was a trail of blood in front of me. It led up to the corner where there was a body slumped over. The person in the corner was a male security guard. He had suffered a jugular trauma. You could see a tear in his throat where the blood was pouring out. I've worked here long enough and seen enough horror movies to know that you cannot help somebody in that condition. I did, however, check to see if he was still alive. I had shined my flashlight on his face and no response. I lightly kicked at his foot to see if it would move, and I got no response. So at this point, I started to panic. This wound was fresh, and whatever did this to him was still out there. I made a rash split decision. I was going to head up back to the floor where I had picked up my first body for the night because hanging out here in the dark didn't seem like a safe idea. I made my way through the back hallways to the closest staircase, keeping my guard up in case whoever attacked that security guard was still around and came for me. I had never seen the hospital this dark before and it was really creeping me out. After reaching the staircase, I began to ascend. As I climbed the steps, I got this gut feeling that I should just turn around and leave. After reaching my desired floor, I tried to peer through the small window on the staircase door, but with the power being out, the lighting was very dim. As I quietly opened the door, I had to hold in a gasp. The lady who had ran the front desk, she was laying face down in a pool of blood. But then there was a nurse, standing next to her, chewing on her throat. The nurse stopped eating her makeshift meal and looked up at me. Her eyes shined yellow in the flashlight beam. She bared her teeth at me and growled. She was acting like a wild animal. And without a moment's notice, she had leaped over the desk and she had started charging at me. She lunged into me and knocked me over. I fell back and hit my head. I only had a moment to think about the pain in my head as I felt a sharp pain in my wrist. She... she bit me. She chomped down on my wrist like it was a goddamn hamburger. Without even thinking, I slammed my flashlight into her forehead. It loosened the grip her teeth had on my wrist and then I kicked her off of me. I pulled myself up and I hauled ass down the hall. Bodies of co-workers and patient lie lifeless amongst the hallway. There was so much blood. I didn't have a lot of time to investigate because my friend who had just bitten me was right behind me. The nurse was hot on my trail with a lopsided run. In a panic, I scanned my environment. I noticed an IV pole to my left. I grasped it firmly and prepared to stand my ground. Stop, don't come any closer, I proclaimed. The nurse kept shambling towards me. There was a door between us and the hallway that had opened up slowly. A sick and confused patient shuffled out. The patient was an elderly woman who was anywhere between her early to late 80s. She asked if anybody could help her. At that very moment, the nurse turned her attention to the patient instead of me. Her gaze snapped to her like a hungry animal, and with a low grunt, she pounced on the patient. No! I shouted in protest, but it was too late. The screams of the elderly woman echoed through the hall, and it was that very scream that brought to life several of the bodies lying around the hall. It was like, it was like the dead had risen. This was too weird. This was almost like out of one of those skin biter movies. I took off running as fast as I could, back towards the staircase that I had taken up to this floor. It was all starting to make sense now. All those threads I read online, this outbreak of a mysterious new virus, then there's the fact that any time someone died here we got rid of the body almost immediately. The hazmat suits that Zectech wore while picking up said bodies, zombies, walking corpses, the undead, the reanimation of non-living tissue. 
Then let's not forget the fact that I was bitten carelessly. I began running. I felt like I was an autopilot. My mind was too busy trying to quell with the fact that I was processing a storm of information. I made it back to where I had first found that security guard earlier in the night. He, or should I say it, was gone, and all that was left instead was a pool of blood. I kept running till I had reached the morgue. I had been trying to decide what the best action was to take next after what had happened on that floor. I decided I was going to use one of the bone saws in the morgue to cut off my right hand. I don't know if it would stop the infection, but it was worth a try. Once I got back to the morgue, I locked myself in. I pulled up my phone and tried to calm down for just a moment. I had a notification for Reddit, threads you might be interested in. I was going to dismiss it until I had saw what the next line was. Zek Tech. After reading the thread, I had found out a few things important. Media outlets around the US are claiming that there's riots breaking out in California. They're claiming these riots are causing fires, looting, power outages, and multiple deaths. Zectech is a branch of the government that is willing to help clean up the messes caused by the public. A couple locals had commented on the thread claiming they found out what Zectech stood for. Zombie Exposure Containment Crew. I dropped my phone. I don't know if I was in shock or just couldn't believe what I was reading. Regardless, I had calmed down a bit and time was of the essence. I took my belt off and I looped it around my forearm. I wanted to make a clean cut about three inches away from where I had received the bite. I waited a few minutes until my arm had felt like it was on pins and needles from cutting off the blood flow. I rolled up a washcloth and bit down on it, and then I began to carve into my own flesh until I hit the bone. I tied a shred of my lab coat to stop the bleeding over my amputated nub. I had to get out of here. I collected my personal effects. When I heard a rhythmic knock, my blood ran cold. That didn't come from the door. There it was again. That was coming from the freezer. It had to be that girl I picked up earlier tonight. Feeling woozy from blood loss, I attempted to stumble my way to the parking garage. After what felt like an eternity, I finally reached the employee exit doors. I used the last bit of my strength to kick the door open. I was met with a blinding light. A voice amplified by a megaphone shouted at me. Stay, Stay where you are, are don't, don't move. move. As my eyes adjusted, I could see there were two large trucks in front of me. I could make out the words on the trucks. Zectech. Several what I assume were men rushed towards me in hazmat suits. They waved this strange radar around my body and it started to beep. After, two of them forced me into the back of one of the trucks. And that's where I'm at now. They weren't too bright as they didn't pat me down or take my phone. I don't know where they're taking me or what's happening outside. I don't even know if my self-amputation was enough to save me from the virus. I've been feeling dizzy for the past hour and I think I got a low-grade fever. But I don't know if that's from the loss of blood or if I'm infected. If anybody reads this thread, tell my family I love them and I'm sorry. Tell them I'm sorry I left them behind for this nightmare. Dad, Dad, I saw a zombie. I was in the kitchen making tea when my little girl came rushing in. She ran through the back door so fast she almost tripped up the step. I poured boiling water from the kettle into my mug, hardly looking up. Oh yeah? Yeah, I did. Its face was all pale and messed up. It was gross, Dad. I put the kettle back and picked up the milk. Sighed inwardly. I really had to be more careful about what I watched on TV in the evening. Rosie has a habit of sneaking downstairs in the night, and last week she caught me watching The Walking Dead, of all things. She's had zombies on the brain ever since. I kept telling her that they're not real, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. Sweetheart, what did we say about zombies? I scooped the tea bag out of the mug and dumped it in the bin. You know, if you keep talking about them, daddy's going to get in trouble with mommy again. Yeah, but I saw one. I know, darling, but I already checked the back garden twice yesterday, and I can promise you it's a zombie-free zone. No, not in the back garden. Hmm? I didn't see it in the back garden. I had the mug half raised to my lips, but now I put it down again. I turned to look at Rosie. Her hair was windswept and her little cheeks were red, as if she'd been running. Sweetheart, I put on my best stern, dad's not happy voice. I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to be honest with me. Have you been playing along the path out back again? I didn't really need to ask the question because I already knew the answer. Rosie is allowed to play in the garden on her own, and sometimes, if she asks us permission first, we let her ride her bike along the path at the back of the house, the one that runs past all the neighbors' back gardens. But 
that's all we allow her to do. This area is pretty safe, but these days you can never be too careful. There was a burglary a couple of roads over a few months ago, and last year someone was mugged on the high street. Several years ago, a few towns over, a little boy even went missing. That was quite a long way away from here, but of course, it made the national news for a few days until the search fizzled out, and it made a lot of parents more cautious. Rosie's getting older now, and she's an adventurous girl, but still, you have to have boundaries. And on a few occasions lately, Rosie's been crossing those boundaries, riding her right further than she should, not coming in straight away when we call her, and sneaking out the back gate when she's only meant to be playing in the garden. As I watched Rosie now, I noticed her face growing redder. She looked away from me, down at the kitchen floor, and scuffed her feet. Dad, I only went a little way down, she said. I promise. I was chatting to Mr. Henderson, because I saw him in the back garden. I said hello and made him jump. I sighed, so there it was. Mr. Henderson was Rosie's zombie. Yesterday it was the postman, and the day before that it was a different neighbor. I took a sip of tea and shook my head. Mr. Henderson was, in fairness, a better candidate than the others. The guy lives on his own and he looks about a hundred years old. Moles all over his face, skin like a deflated balloon. Whenever we'd chatted over the garden fence before though, he'd always seemed nice enough, just a bit lonely. I couldn't have Rosie going around calling him a zombie. Listen to me, sweetheart. I know you didn't go far or anything. But I don't want you... I came right back after two, Dad. Rosie interrupted. She was staring up at me now. Blue eyes, large and pleading. I promise. And I even said no when Mr. Henderson offered me an ice cream, because I know you don't like me taking stuff from strangers. I opened my mouth to respond, then paused. He offered you ice cream? Yeah, but I said no. Mr. Henderson really wanted me to come in and have one, but I told him I had to get home. And then I came straight back here to tell you I'd seen a zombie, and I... Rosie was babbling now, her voice whirring like a motor. But I'd stopped listening. My mind was still stuck on something she'd said a moment before. Mr. Henderson really wanted me to come in and have one. I took another sip of tea and frowned. That wasn't good. I didn't mind the neighbors chatting to my little girl, but I didn't like the thought of them inviting her in. Not without us there. Not even if they were just kind, lonely old men. I made up my mind to go around and visit Mr. Henderson later and tell him myself. Kindly, of course, but firmly. In the end, though, I didn't get a chance, because a few moments after I had had that thought, Rosie said something else. Something that pushed everything else from my mind and ended any idea I might have about going over to Mr. Henderson's house. She said something that made me feel cold. Daddy, please don't stop me playing in the garden. I promise I won't sneak out again. I don't want the zombie to get me. Rosie, I'm not going to stop you playing in the garden. But you have to make me a couple of promises, too. First promise, you'll stop going around calling people zombies. Mr. Henderson may be old, but he's not one of the living dead. Rosie frowned. I didn't. What do you mean you didn't? You just ran in here a moment ago calling him one. No, I didn't. Mr. Henderson's not a zombie. I saw the zombie in his house, but it wasn't him. I frowned. I had the mud raised to my lips to take another sip of tea, but now I put it down again. What do you mean, sweetheart? You saw someone else in his house? Yeah, the zombie, Dad. I could see it pressed against his little basement window while I was talking to him. Cold fingers ran up my spine. What? Yeah, it was really scary. Its face was all bashed up and bloody and its mouth was open like it was screaming at me. Do you know what confused me most, Dad? I tried to keep my voice steady. What? Well, I didn't realize kids could be zombies too. I thought it was only grown-ups. But I guess I must have been wrong, because the one at Mr. Henderson's basement looked just like a little boy. The last thing I remembered before waking up alone in the woods was being at the bar with a friend, Frank, when a woman walked into the place. It had been raining all day and she was soaking wet, her long mousy hair clumped together in strings, 
and water dripped from the hem of her dark red skirt. She was kind of tall, and while far from a supermodel, she was easy on the eyes. It was a little odd that she didn't have an umbrella with her considering how the weather had been lately. She ruffled the collar of her tan canvas jacket to shake the water off. There was something about her as she coolly scanned the room, like she was looking for something in particular. Our gazes met, and I was instantly mesmerized by the deep chestnut-colored pools of her eyes. The rest is still a bit blurry, but I remember her walking up to me and saying something to the effect of that her car had broken down about a block away, and she was wondering if I could help her. I couldn't take my eyes off of her full red lips as she spoke, and felt myself numbly nod in agreement to go help her. My buddy didn't even try to stop me as I got up and followed the stranger out the door. We got to her vehicle, an old 80-something station wagon, and after she popped the hood, I bent over to look into the engine compartment. There was a flash of light, a sharp crack and stinging pain, then everything went black. That's how I ended up in that dark, dense forest, I suppose. Unsure of where in the world I really was. The sun was setting low in the sky, not that it mattered much, as the canopy of leaves blocked most of the light anyways. Panic struck me as soon as I realized the direness of my situation. Hey! Hey! Is anyone here? I screamed into the seemingly endless woods. Lady! Frank! Is this some kind of a joke? No one responded, not even the birds. Then that fact hit me over the head like a ton of bricks. Even in this desolate place, there should be some kind of life. Something, a bird, a bug, an animal, anything. There was nothing, however. It was absolutely silent except for the sound of my own beating heart and the rain that continued to fall into the leaves far above. With nothing else to do, I sat down and put my head in my hands. My mind raced with thoughts of, why me? What's going to happen now? What did that woman want, and is this how I'm going to die? That last thought forced tears from my eyes that didn't stop for at least five minutes. Once my frustration had expelled itself, I figured I had to find a way out of there. So after running my jacketed arm under my nose, I stood up and began to walk in no direction in particular. I wasn't worried about getting lost, and I sure wasn't going to wait around to see if that woman would come back for me. Interest in her and what she wanted with me had waned ever since she hit me in the head. She must have carried me in somehow, or had helped to do it, because there were no tire tracks or trails as far as I could see. It appeared as the ground itself hadn't even been disturbed except for where my body had been placed. Not long after I began my walk, I was forced to stop. The sun had completely set, and while the moon provided decent light, the shadows cast by the trees and their branches made it difficult to make out the terrain. Last thing I wanted was to step in a hole or trip over a root and twist my ankle. The rain had stopped, at least, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Ribbons of steam escaped my lips in the cold, damp night. Hypothermia was a real threat in a place like this. I was pushing together some fallen leaves to use as a blanket when I heard a twig snap in the distance. Unsure if it was the woman or some other form of life, my mind raced in fear and excitement at the prospect of another living soul out there with me. Maybe it was a backpacker or search and rescue. Worry of a broken leg fled my thoughts as I took off towards the sound with caution and excitement. Streams of moonlight fluttered onto the ground, illuminating splotches of the forest floor. Under one of those streams, I saw something. It looked to be a man. He was hunched over, examining something that I couldn't make out because his body blocked it from my view. Hey, you lost out here too? I asked, since he didn't seem to have a backpack on to indicate he was a hiker. My name's James. Maybe we could go find some help together. Whatever he was looking at engrossed all of his attention. He let off faint snarling and slurping noises that got louder as I approached. If you got something to eat, would you mind sharing? I haven't had anything for a while, I said. He still didn't respond, but only dug into what he had with greater veracity. I put my hand on his shoulder gingerly. Hey, buddy, I said. The leaves moved in the wind, adjusting the angle of the light to give a clear view of what he had been working on. What once had been a smile on my face, happy to meet someone else out there, slowly dissolved into a look of shock and disgust. Underneath the stranger that I had met was another human body, 
barely recognizable as such from having been chewed on for what must have been a good while. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, I'm, I'm suddenly, I'm suddenly not hungry. I, I, I think, I, I think, I, I think I'm just gonna leave now. I stammered. The crouched man finally took notice of me. His head slowly turned as he let out a rumbling growl. Blank white eyes flashed violently. His face was scarred and peeling. Pustules rose from his pitted skin and his stark white hand reached to grab mine. Jesus, save me! I screamed while reeling backwards and falling flat on my ass. Dead leaves and dirt flew all around when I scrambled back onto my feet and took off. The man, who was more ghoul than human, lunged and fell onto his face. Without even a look back, I was off into the pitch of night hoping I didn't kill myself on a low-hanging branch. Suddenly, there was the sound of running all around me. Through the patches of darkness, I could see other forms chasing me from left and from the right. There must have been hundreds of them all eager to devour me. Into the trees! I heard a small voice cry. Unsure of what it meant or how to do that, I kept running. Mister, up here! A firelight flickered from a branch about a hundred yards ahead. Sprinting as fast as I could, I prepared to transition from running to jumping and took the mightiest leap of my life. My fingers fought to purchase a hold on the rough bark when a hand grabbed my wrist and started to help. Cold, dead fingers gripped my ankles and threatened to pull me back to the earth. I kicked like a mule to get free and pull myself up. Snarling and snapping rose from the inky blackness below me when I was finally able to pull myself up to my elbow and then the rest of the way. You're safe for now, mister. The small voice said, its face shadowed by the flame of a torch. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. My name's James. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Vivian. I'm glad you made it. I haven't seen another person survive in weeks. She said. Survive? Survive them? Who else is out here? What are those things? How are you still alive? The questions came out like a shotgun blast. We need to leave, like now. They can not climb trees, but they always have a way of getting you. Stunned by her casual demeanor, I had no choice but to agree, and wait till later for my questions to be answered. Silently, among the boughs of the trees we walked from one branch to the next, sounds of those ghoulish creatures slowly faded into the night. Could have been an hour, could have been fifteen minutes, but we finally made it to a spot that Vivian thought was safe enough to get back onto the ground. We came to a big rock, and she grabbed a long thick branch from nearby, handed me the torch, then pried the rock to the side, revealing a cavern beneath. In here, we'll be safe. She said, and then made her way down. I followed her in. Move the rock back so they don't get in, she said, and I complied. Down a long hallway she led me. The bare earth walls were held back by balls of roots, and in some places were held up by a makeshift wall of sticks. We entered a larger chamber, where I could finally stand upright. It was about five feet by five feet and a little over six feet tall. There were pine needles on the floor as a kind of carpeting and some extra needles piled up in a corner for a bed. There was a small hole in the roof, and in the middle some rocks and a circle with burnt wood in the center. Along the wall there were some more holes for airflow, I assumed. This is quite impressive. You make all of this? I asked. No. Vivian said. The man that used to live here found it and made it cooler. He thought that it had slowly been built by people who had survived and found it as well. His name was Aaron. He taught me all sorts of stuff, like how to make a torch, where to find lots of berries and even how to make tea out of pine needles. Her voice trailed off and she sniffled a little bit. Light now flooded the room and I could finally make out her features. She was a young girl, maybe 12 to 14. It was hard to place with all the dirt on her. Real thin and tall, with mid-length blonde hair and a gentle face, if not gaunt from lack of eating. Her lower lip quivered a bit at remembering Aaron, and she fought back the tears. Where's Aaron now? I asked. He's one of them now. I got careless, but he saved me. If they bite you and don't eat all of you, first you turn to one of them. I don't really want to talk about it right now. I'm sleepy. Good night. She said, and with that she dropped onto the pine needle bed and was out in seconds. Numb from all that had transpired that day, I sat there a while sorting things out. Every now and again I could hear a growl or the shuffling of feet from above, but they never seemed to try to get in. Weariness soon overtook me, and heavy eyelids refused to open again. Hey, get up! Vivian said while delivering a sharp blow to my shins. Don't tell me I saved a lazy man. 
Dazed and confused, I looked around, if not just a little disappointed that this nightmare had not ended once I woke up. Here, she said and shoved a leaf containing some nuts and a few berries under my nose. Eat. For being such a small girl, she sure had a commanding presence. I took a nut or two in my mouth and chewed. The walnuts were bitter, but edible. The berries, on the other hand, were sweet and popped in my mouth. Even if I couldn't place what kind they were, they were delicious. Hunger took over and the little offering she gave me was gone in seconds. Hey, are there any more? I asked. No, if you want more, we have to go and find them. She replied and then handed me a roughly shaped wooden cup. The wood was raw and swollen from the liquid. It was more a hollowed out branch than a cup, but it worked and the pine tea was palatable. How long you been out here? I asked. Long enough, maybe a month or two. It's been hard to keep track of. Where are we? No one really knows. Aaron was looking for a way out before he got turned. That's what, that's what we were doing that day. This Aaron sounds like a smart guy. He must have figured something out, right? He had an idea, but the route is dangerous. He told me another survivor had found a big fence off to the east, but it's electrified and impossible to get over. We were going to look for it when I, I don't want to talk about it. I get it. It's hard, but we can't stay here. We have to try, I said. Why can't we? I know how to survive, and I can teach you too. Just like Aaron taught me. It's only when we try to leave that bad things happen. You're the ninth person I've seen dropped out here, and the first one to make it long enough to be rescued. I don't want to lose anyone else or be turned myself, so I say we stay here and survive. You know we can't, I said. And that brings up another question. Why are people brought out here? I'm not sure. People just showed up. No reason or timing for it. They showed up at random times and days. You're the ninth I've seen, but I know more people have been brought in because the groups of those things keep getting larger. Vivian looked down and thought. I've seen people, people in white lab gear, walking around. I don't think they've seen me though. They have a clipboard and write notes down. I tried to follow one once, but I lost him in the woods. He just disappeared. I think they have secret entrances throughout the place. It's like they're running some kind of crazy experiment like in the movies. They're testing these things. I was grabbed by a lady in a bar, I told her. I was taken off the streets by a man in a black van, she said. Silence took over the conversation for a moment as we were both lost in thoughts of some other place. Finally, I broke the tranquility. We can't stay here, Vivian. A tear rolled down her cheek and she nodded. I, I know. It's just I ain't got nothing to go back to. My mom and dad fight all the time. It's like they don't even know I exist. I don't have much either. My wife left me some time ago. Still, being out there alone is better than being here and eaten. You're probably right. At least in here we know who the monsters are though. We can try to get out, but we have to get some supplies first. We need to be better prepared than Aaron and I were. The next few days, we dodged the ghouls and collected food, and I even showed her how to make a spear using sharp rocks, large branches, and some fibers from clothes scavenged from the dead that weren't still walking around. Honestly, I kinda guessed and figured it out as I went, but it worked, and we found out you could permanently end one of those creatures if you stabbed it through the head. This seemed to fill Vivian with a small amount of hope, and finally she was talking about going to find the fence. I didn't bring it up, but we had no idea how to get over the fence even if we did find it. It was something that would have to be solved once we got there. The day finally arrived that we were as prepared as we were going to get. We had made some small tie pouches from clothes and filled them with food. Water would have to be gotten the same way she had been, from rain, puddles, or the small streams that ran throughout the place. We purified it by placing hot rocks into wooden cups full of water. Spears in hand, we left as the sun began to rise and stuck to the trees as much as possible as we headed towards the rising sun. About midday, we reached an open field that forced us to ground. Vivian stopped and stared out over the open grass. Be careful. You can't see the ones laying down. This is where I lost Aaron. Hey, stay glued to me. We got spears this time. We'll be okay, I said. She nodded in fierce resolve and we started to cross the open ground. Halfway through, something cold and strong grabbed my ankle, which caused me to trip. My spear flew from my hand as I reached out to stop my fall. 
In a flash, one of those things began to climb my leg. Mouth open, it threatened to take a chunk out of my calf. In the blink of an eye, its grip loosened and it slumped to rest on me. A spear protruded from the top of its head and I heard Vivian say with ice in her voice, Not this time. She spat on the lifeless corpse and with a sickening slurp, pulled her weapon free. Oh, thanks, I said, then kicked it off of me. She continued on while I grabbed my spear then hustled to catch up. Other ghouls in the grass were easier to spot as they dragged themselves towards us. The grass moved which gave away their position and we either speared them or avoided them easily. Late in the afternoon we reached the tree line. Over there the forest was mostly pine and not suitable to go into the trees. They're more active at night. We need to find a place to shelter before it's too late. Vivian said. I had hoped to stay the night up in the branches, but this unforeseen change in the trees did not bode well. Let's keep going for now. Maybe something will turn up, I told her. We pressed on and by the time the light began to fade, the best we could do was a rocky outcrop that had a tunnel between two rocks. We made a small fire and heated a few rocks to clean the water we had gotten from a little stream nearby. We'll have to sleep in shifts, since this isn't as secure as your cave. I'll keep watch first. You get some rest, I told Vivian. She didn't protest, and after a meager meal, she fell asleep instantly. Night had settled in hard by the time I heard a twig snap not far off. I grabbed my spear and waited breathlessly for any other sound. Darkness rimmed the edges of the reach of the light from our small fire. For a forest with no life, at that moment it seemed like there was movement everywhere I looked. Imagination took hold and every swaying branch or pine needle looked menacing. I was about to resolve that it was my mind getting away from me when out of nowhere a ghoul reached around the edge of the rock and tried to grab me. Curses flew from my mouth while I edged back into the protective covering. The ghoul stumbled in and I speared it right under its chin and up into its head. Relief washed over me thinking the threat had passed. I just started to relax again when I heard multiple twigs snap very close by. I pulled a torch out from our supplies and lit it, then wandered a ways out. The forest was alive with movement. It had not been my imagination. Ghouls were lined up as far as the light could reach and they were all headed our way. Sprinting back to the cave, I shook Vivian awake and told her to get going. She grabbed her gear and bolted from the cave. I was about to exit myself when one of those things grabbed me. With a kick and a shake, I broke free and followed after her. Now, let me tell you, these ghouls are fast, as fast as any human is alive. Hot on our heels, they chased us across the moonlight forest. Vivian pulled up and halted dead in her tracks. I almost ran into her back. In front of us was a fence of 20 feet tall at least. Dead ghoul bodies lay charred and burnt across thick electrified cable. Snarling grew louder from behind, impassable fence in front. It didn't look good. This way, I yelled and took off to the left in the hopes of finding some way to get across the fence to freedom. Vivian followed me as the swarm of ghouls behind us tagged along. James! Vivian screamed. I turned to find she had been overtaken by one of them. Tangled on the ground, she struggled not to be bit. Hold him still, I told her as I ran up. She grabbed him by the neck and I speared it dead. She got up and without a word we were running again. It wasn't even a hundred yards later that my foot fell into a hole. I toppled forward and landed hard on the packed earth. She helped me up and in the next step I fell over again writhing in pain. My ankle is sprained pretty bad, I said. I didn't even have to look at it to know it was swelling already. Heat flared from the joint and each step felt like fire. Lean on me, Vivian told me. We have to get going. We hobbled along for a while, but it was clear she wasn't going to make it with me slowing her down. Ghouls kept coming and were gaining on us fast. No, y you go. My words trailed off and I did a double take. In a whole forest of pine trees, there was one tall and noble oak, its branches proudly growing over the electrified fence. Look, I said and pointed to the tree. Vivian didn't need me to explain why I was excited. She helped me over to the tree and she scurried up first. The undead were close now and I would be vulnerable in my current state if I climbed the tree. I threw the torch at them and in my surprise they halted for a second. They seemed to be afraid of the fire. This gave me enough time to jump from my good leg and Vivian pulled me up. They didn't stop long however and were soon at the base of the tree. You go and get over. I got some time now to make it, I told her. She nodded and kept climbing till she was on a branch well above the fence. I watched as she scurried out and cleared the barrier. 
The branch dipped a bit under her weight and she leaped to safety with a duck and a roll she was across. Come on, let's go! She screamed. Ravenously, the ghouls beneath me had begun to trample on each other which raised them closer. It would only be a matter of time before they could reach me and I knew I had to move. Fingers brushed the bottom of my shoe as I pulled myself onto the next branch. Slow and painfully I maneuvered my way up until I was on the same branch Vivian had used. Out on the limb it began to bow under my weight. I must have been at least a hundred pounds heavier than the waif of a girl that Vivian is. Crack went the branch, then snap, and I was falling in the air not even two feet from the fence. I was able to push off the branch a little bit and get more distance before it contacted the cables and they erupted in loud pops and bright sparks. The impact knocked the wind out of me. Gasps of breath came with much effort. I had landed on my side, which fortunately spared my good ankle, yet had dislocated my shoulder and broken a rib. Even better though, I had landed on the right side of the fence. After five minutes, I was able to walk again with Vivian's assistance. It took two more days until we reached civilization. Unsure of who was running that place, we made an anonymous phone call to the local and federal police along with a few major news organizations for good measure. Maybe it was a company doing research on some kind of virus, or a shadow organization testing a new form of weapon, or the government itself doing some sort of clandestine experiment. We may never know. As for Vivian and myself, we didn't know if we were selected specially or taken at random, which made returning to a normal life difficult. We were unsure if they were watching and waiting to grab us again, Either way, neither of us felt safe going back to our old lives, and neither of us had lives we wanted to go back to. We now live as father and daughter, out on our own in a small, quiet, rural town. Another day, another half dollar, my dude. At least that's what I say when I head to work. My name's Kyle, and I'm one of those pizza dudes. I didn't always used to be a pizza boy. I used to be a server. But ever since that mysterious virus hit, everyone's doing this social distancing thing. And they closed the restaurant. Sadly, because of that, I had to take up a job as a pizza boy. It's not all bad, I'm only, you know, 25. Luckily, a lot of people have been staying home. I mean, not luckily like it's good people are staying home, but because they're staying home, it means they're ordering pizza or other food to their door. In short, it means I can pay my rent. Things have been kind of weird ever since this virus hit. I'm not one of those sheep who follows the media, but they claim people are dying daily from this. Gotten to the point where everyone's wearing masks and stuff now. And there's this pop-up new company that showed up in town. You see their trucks and vans everywhere. They're almost as prominent as all the Amazon vans. Zectech, whatever that means. Little did I know I was going to find out exactly what that meant. I had an encounter, if you will, with Zectech firsthand, and uh, it was not chill, my dude. It's a standard Friday. I'm just straight kicking it at Pizza Loney's. That's where I work. <laughs> An online order's placed. I collect the requested food items, place them in my pizza bag that keeps the heat in, hop in my super steady Chevy Malibu, circa 2011. I slap my Android in the claw suction cup to my dash, Pull up the trusted Zubal maps. I punch in the requested address of the pizza purchaser. And I cruise my way on there. Tonight has an off vibe. Half the radio stations are playing emergency broadcasts. So I just keep flipping over to the next one because I need them killer tunes. It's the same thing. You play a good song or two and then all of a sudden the radio goes static and it's rioting and looting here. Beware over there. Took a couple shortcuts and back roads to get to my delivery destination. But I upheld the pizza loney name. So, I've got like two minutes left before I hit that 30 minutes or late mark. Well, what do you know? That's just enough time for Kyle to spark a little JJ. <coughs> Ooh, after 30 seconds of holding that stuff in, I'm feeling toasty. Now that I'm relaxed and nice, I get out of the car and grab my pizza bag. I walk up to the front door and I ring the bell. A solid minute goes by. Wow, not cool, dude. I've dealt with these jerk-offs before. This is the kind of guy that makes you wait until the 30-minute mark's up and tries to get that free pizza through the Pizza Loney's guarantee. Well, I wasn't late, and I wasn't paying for this damn pizza. I balled up my fist, and I gave that door three solid poundings. <laughs> I wait. 30 seconds go by. A minute goes by. It's time to pound again. Hello, 
is anybody here? It's Pizza Loney's. We got that stuffed crust that'll flip your pepperonis. No response. This was seriously not chill. I make a dire decision and I'm gonna head around back and see if uh, maybe they're hanging out there. After making my way through their back gate, I find myself a nice little porch. I knock on the screen door. Hello, is uh, anybody home? Still nothing. I can faintly hear voices though. Ugh, Kyle's guts tells him to turn around and leave, but his pockets cannot afford that. I slowly and cautiously creep onto the porch. The lights are on inside the house as I can see through the sliding glass door they have. There's curtains, but they're pretty see-through. I can make out a TV, that's on. Two recliners in the living room, and I want to say the outline of someone's head in one of the recliners? Well, oh, here we go. Super awkward time, let's get it. After taking a deep breath, I knock on the glass door. Hello, is anyone home? Pizza Loney's with a fresh hot pie. No response. I was going to just turn around, but I know for a fact that some dude was sitting five feet away from me in a recliner. I took a deep breath and gathered my resolve. I exhaled and whispered under my breath, no dogs, no dogs, no dogs, no dogs. I'll be real, I don't like dogs. I opened the slider door and announced myself once again, hello, Pizza Loney's. And lo and behold, recliner dude did not respond. I sat down my pizza bag on his table. I gave him a light tap on the shoulder. No response. I walked around the recliner so I was face to face with the man. His eyes were closed and there was a single drip of blood running down from his nostril. Oh shit. Either this guy was partying pretty hard, or he was under quarantine for having that new virus. After giving the room a quick glance around, I found a stunning lack of nose candy and rolled up Benji's. This guy was under quarantine, it had to be. Shit, and I forgot my face mask in the car. After looking him up and down, I noticed he wasn't breathing. Oh crap, I gotta check and see if he's got a pulse now. Reluctantly, I placed two fingers to his jugular. His skin was cold, and there was no pulse. And even though I couldn't feel his heartbeat, I could feel mine in my throat. For a short moment, my senses had vanished. The TV behind me that was blaring zoned out. I could hear a white noise, almost like a frequency. I wanted to run, but I had already entered the house. It almost seemed like I was breaking and entering. Even though I was just trying to deliver my pizza and do my job, I could go to jail if I left this guy. So I pulled out my phone, I dialed the 9, and then the 1 twice. For a few moments I heard it ring, and then I heard a click as someone picked up on the other end. 911, what's your emergency? Hey, um, okay, so I am a pizza guy who's here to deliver a fresh hot pie from Pizza Loney's. Sir, may I remind you this line is for emergencies only? No, no, wait, I, I know that, don't hang up. So, I went and checked on my customer who was supposed to be answering my door. When they didn't answer, I went around back. I entered their home, and I found them dead. So at that point, I didn't know what to do, and I called you. Dead, huh? And you confirmed the death? Yeah, sadly, my dude. He had no pulse, and there was blood dripping from his nostrils. Sir, do you know how long said person has been deceased? Uh, no, not really. I mean, it can't have been that long. He ordered a pie like 45 minutes ago. Sir, you said you checked his pulse. Was the body cold? Yeah, um, yeah, it was, actually. Sir, I'm going to need the address that you're at, and I'm going to request that you stay where you are, as a specialty unit is on its way. Yeah, 4554 Maple Drive. You can't miss that pimp mobile of a Chevy Malibu with the Pizza Loney's logo in the driveway. Next, I awkwardly called my boss. After I informed my job that this customer not only couldn't pay for the pizza, was no longer of this earthly plane, I waited around for the response unit, and I figured, hey, this dude's dead, and I might as well have a slice. I was mindlessly chopping away as I gazed out the glass door that I had entered from towards the backyard. Well, you know how, like, if glass is clean enough, you can kind of see a reflection in it if the lighting's right? I may have been blazed, but I definitely caught movement in my eye out of the reflection of the glass. As I spun around, I was met with the shock of a lifetime. This dude was standing up, and he looked pissed as hell. Hey now, bro amigo, this isn't what it looks like. No response. He looked like he was teeming with rage, and... Something was off about him. His eyes were an unnatural color. They were this sunshine yellow. Sir, I'm not breaking and entering, I promise. I was here to bring you your dinner. He tilted his neck to the side like a confused animal. And like, you weren't answering, so I came around back and I saw you and you still weren't answering. So then I came in and checked on you and you were... Before I could finish my sentence, he opened his mouth. Disgusting slimy texture of what looked like bile 
Blood, blood clots, and possibly some of his tongue fell onto the floor. He let out an angry roar like a berserk beast. It gave me goosebumps and I pressed myself against the glass door. He started coming at me. At first it was a shamble, but it picked up into a lopsided run. I ran around to the other side of the table. If you were on looking from afar, it looked like we were playing one of those games a three-year-old does. If you were in my point of view, you've got some rabbit creepy old man who wants to do something to you which could be murder. Instead of trying to pick a side of the table to corner me on, he leapt right across it. I hurried towards the recliner where I had found him. There was a coffee table between the recliners and had a vase of flowers in it. I picked that shit up and when he came close to me, I gave him the Kyle crush and smashed it on his head. And it put him down, or at least I thought it did. I didn't want to be in this house any longer and I went to exit through the front door. As I opened the front door, I felt a tug on the leg of my jeans. This crazy bastard was clinging to me and trying to chomp my anky. I used my free foot to kick him off. While this was happening, I saw headlights roll across us as someone pulled into the driveway. I want to say I heard like four car door slams as I was busy fighting this guy off my anky. A blinding light was shown on my face, followed by the booming voice of a megaphone. Sir, so we request, request you stop, stop what you're doing and refrain from leaving the property. property. Yeah, sure bro dudes, except I got this guy trying to make a human hamburger out of my ankle. Just like that, I saw somebody run across the yard to the side of the house. As I held onto the door frame and fought off my not so dead customer, I want to say 15 seconds passed before I heard the shatter of glass from behind me. Two people in riot gear attempted to apprehend the guy who was trying to eat my anky. Somebody in riot gear approached me and told me I needed to come with them. I protested and explained I was still on the clock and I had to finish my shift, my dude. I was told everything would be handled, I had the Zec Tech guarantee, but I needed to get in the back of their van right now. The van I was forced into was very futuristic looking from the inside. It had multiple sections that were cut off by plexiglass. These sections were just big enough to barely sit in. I was forced into one, and after a few moments later they brought my friend who was trying to make a snack out of me and put him in another one. Although this time he looked more like when I first found him. Lifeless. Once they all piled back in the van, I attempted to ask multiple questions. My mind was racing. Okay, so one, what the hell was that? Two, who the hell are you? And three, why are you bringing Captain Chompy Lop? One of the people in the riot gear looked at me and just held their finger up to their mouth, insinuating I should be quiet. Twenty-five minutes or so went by on this really uncomfortable ride. When we did finally stop, I was forced off the van and then they blindfolded me. I was forced to walk for, I don't know, probably another ten minutes where I was finally dumped off in some small metal room that only had two chairs and a metal table in the center. I was left alone for about 25 minutes or so, and uh, I was not getting any service whatsoever. While playing on my phone, suddenly the door flew open. A man in the same riot gear as I had seen before, he didn't look as jacked as the other guys, or girls, I don't want to come off as sexist. A man in the gear approached the table with a clipboard in his hand. He sat down at the table, and he announced himself. Why, hello there, Kyle. I'm Agent Z13. Whoa, 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 Marcel, Marceau. How do you know my name? Why, Kyle, we know everything about you. We know that you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's for sure. Psh, what are you talking about, dude? I was doing my job. I'm talking about the fact that you got rustled up in our work with one of them there skin biters. Skin what? Wait, is, is that why he was trying to chomp me? Why, indeed, young man. Those who are unfortunate enough to die from this new virus sometimes don't stay dead. Uh, w what? Now, now, I understand that is a lot to process, but I promise you, this is true. Now you see, young Kyle, we have a problem here, as you saw something you should not have seen. So, what are we gonna do about that? Well, son, the way I see it, you got two options. You either walk out of here, or you don't. Wait, like, I can just leave? Well, now that depends. Solely on your decisions you make next. Alright, G-Man, hit me with it. What do I gotta do? If you choose freedom, which is your choice solely, you will be signing these papers I have in my hand. These papers justify that if for any reason you talk about the events that you had witnessed this evening with anybody, your actions will be held as treason to your country and you will be deemed as a terrorist. And I'm sure you know what the government does to terrorists, especially on U.S. soil. I understand, my dude. My silence is my freedom, and I'll never speak on it again. There's more to it, though. We need to make sure you're not around people for a while, as you will need to be quarantined since you are around one of the subjects. If you do choose said quarantine, we will be reaching out to your former place of employment and explaining as to why you will not be returning. Wait, former? Did, did they fire me? No, son, we'll be quitting the job for you at this point. Dude, I, I can't. I, I have rent. 
at which place you will be starting your mandatory quarantine and your own home environment, and we will be sending you a monthly check to cover all expenses needed upon living. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. I keep my mouth shut, and I get paid, and I don't gotta deliver pizzas for pizza lonies no more? Hell yeah, G-Man, let me sign that right now. That was a month ago. I kinda miss people. This social distancing thing isn't really that fun. At least I'm getting paid for this whole endeavor. Every now and again though, with the money I'm making from this government check, I do order myself some pizza lones, and I see the boys. We chat for a few moments after I leave them a nice fat tip, <laughs> and I go back to eating pizza and gaming. As for what Zectech's doing with those zombies, beats me. I'm no guessing man, but if I had to bet, it probably has something to do with their name, as Z stands for zombie. Eh, who cares, when this whole thing blows over, I'm gonna release a book on the entire thing. You know, unless, like, <laughs> the whole world ends and the apocalypse strikes. <laughs> yeah, right, like, something like that could ever happen in sunny California. I used to live in a major city in the U.S. when I was about 18, and this is by far the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. One night, I had just gotten into an argument with my girlfriend that I had just moved in with, so I was, to say the least, stressed out. Needing some time to myself, I put on my jacket and take a walk around the block to compose myself and maybe get a biscuit on the way. Fast forward about 10 minutes of walking, I look ahead of me and see a man walking in a very odd way. His head was looking up at the sky while walking in different directions. I assumed he was on something as the city was notorious for drug dealers, but then he got even more strange. He started abruptly making weird and bizarre noises, as if he had some sort of condition. Not wanting to pry and too tired to care, I simply walked past the man, and that's when I did something I still regret doing. I turn around, and he's now looking at me. His hair was a mess and his mouth was hung open, exposing his teeth that looked old and cracked. I could also see craze in his red eyes, indicating that he was probably high. Suddenly he starts full on charging at me and making these noises. I cursed myself and started running in the opposite direction, but this guy was fast as hell. All the while, I'm breathing heavily making sure I'm outpacing him and praying that I don't trip. I eventually hid behind a dumpster in an alleyway while he kept running forward, thankfully not noticing me. When the coast was clear, I dove out of the dumpsters and booked it back to my girlfriend's place where I broke down crying. I'm aware that men aren't supposed to cry as much about things, but this was an incident that scared me for life. It was terrifying. We had since moved from that city, and I thankfully never saw that man again.